morning, everyone. It's 9 o'clock, and my wonderful colleagues are having a good time somewhere. So shortly, they'll be here. We have to have a quorum, and so just waiting a few minutes, but I welcome you all. And baseball season started last night in Korea. The Dodgers won. And do we have any uh, pithy information that we care to share? Is this the week of the what? I have to share it on my council comments, but it is, it's Mr. Rogers Day. Oh, oh, I, I, that would, you could do it again. Fine. <laughs> Today is Mr. Rogers Day, uh, which, which means that it's a time to remember to celebrate your neighbors and find out everything about them and get to know them and bring them a plate of cookies and make your community better by getting to know your neighbors. I love it. I love Mr. Rogers. Okay. I looked over their biography on Spotify. The audio on, biography. Oh, Mr. Rogers. it's on Spotify? Yeah. Wonderful. It. It's 18 hours long. Oh, <laughs> that's a whole day. Okay, here we go, everyone, and uh, Rabbi Wine is here with us today, and we thank you so much. Um, this is the March 20th, 2024 meeting of the City Council, which is called to order. The meeting has been properly noticed and posted in compliance with the open meeting law. These proceedings are being video recorded as well as presented live on KCLV Cable Channel 2. You may also watch this meeting live on Apple TV, Roku, and Amazon Fire TV on the Go Vegas app. The City Council meeting, as well as all other KCLV programming, may be viewed on the internet at www.kclv.tv forward slash live. The proceedings will be rebroadcast on KCLV Channel 2 and the web the Wednesday of the meeting at 8 p.m., Friday at 4 a.m., Saturday at 7 p.m., Sunday at 7 a.m., and the following fr uh, Monday at 5 p.m. This building is protected by state-of-the-art fire detection and suppression sprinkler systems. If alarm should activate during today's meeting, please evacuate using the exit at the back of the chambers, go out to the mezzanine, proceed out the double doors to the terrace, and go down the back staircase. For anyone who has difficulty with stairs, please check with a marshal or fire official for assistance. Once outside, assemble on the northeast corner across the street from City Hall at Lewis and First Streets. Employees wearing safety vests or city marshals will inform you when it's safe to re-enter the building. For public comment re related to the items on the agenda, citizen participation and public hearing items, we have available a speaker card which you may complete and submit to the city clerk up front. Cards are available in the clerk's office or at the rear of these chambers. However, if you do not submit a card, it does not prevent you from speaking under public comment, citizen participation, or specified public hearing items. If anyone's present today who has need for hearing impaired equipment, please see our city clerk's staff. And if you parked in the parking garage across the street, a self-validation machine is located in the foyer between our council chambers and the security desk you walk through to enter chambers. You must have your ticket with you to use the machine. However, if you do not, please see security personnel when exiting for a validation coupon. Before we proceed with the agenda, would everyone please rise for the invocation given by Rabbi Itzwein Young Israel, Asia, Las Vegas, and remain standing for the pledge. And good morning. Good morning, everyone. S such a pleasure to see everyone. And thank you for inviting me back. So there's an old joke that describes Jewish holidays, and that is, they tried to kill us. We won. Let's eat. <laughs> and um, and we, we do have another Jewish holiday coming up this Saturday night and all day Sunday. It's the holiday of Purim. It, record, it is uh, in celebration of the events that were recorded in the Book of Esther, which happened in around the time period about 355 BCE. And the way we celebrate is we get, we get in costumes, we have a big party, we all get drunk. Some people get really drunk. Uh, the, uh, you go around and you, you give gifts of food to your friends. We give gifts of, to, uh, to the poor. 
And, um, and we read the story, uh, the book of Esther. We read it at night, we read it again during the day. And the book of Esther is, you know, it's found in, of course, in the, in the Jewish Bible. It's found in, if you have a Christian Bible, it's found in the Old Testament. And it's a remar one of the remarkable books because of the 24 books in the Bible, uh, God's name is not mentioned once. A little curious about that. Um, and, and there's many miracles that lead to the redemption of the Jewish people. And one of the messages is that if you want to see God in your life, you're going to see God. And if you want to miss it, you can miss it. So that's one of the powerful messages that is in the book of Esther. But it really chronicles a series of miraculous events. Could be coincident coincidental, uh, but we know they're, they're, it's uh, stirred by the hand of God, where there is an evil man, Haman, uh, and the wicked king, Ahasuerus, and they conspire to set out a decree of genocide uh, where they will kill every single Jew in the entire world. And due to a uh, remarkable series of events, Esther, uh, the, 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 the initial queen, is murdered by the king, and Esther rises to take her place. Esther is a Jewish girl. And uh, right after the decree of genocide is set out, Esther's uncle sends a message and sends her and says, Esther, you've got to go into the palace, and you've got to plead on behalf of the Jewish people. And the king, does, at this point, does not know that she's Jewish. And Esther's response is, I can't go because I have not been summoned within 30 days. Anyone who just shows up to the king, that's a capital offense, unless he forgives you right away, and I probably will be killed. And this king, by the way, kills his wives. So, like, you know, like, this is, this is a pretty good thing. I'm going to be a goner. And, and uh, I want to read to you a, a short paragraph about Mordecai's response, because it's very telling about what we should do in our own lives today. They related Esther words to Mordecai. Then Mordecai sent a reply to Esther. He said, do not imagine that you will be able to escape the king's palace any more than the rest of the Jews. For if we persist in keeping silent at a time like this, relief and deliverance will come to the Jews from some other place, while you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether it was just for this such a time that you attained the royal position. This is, her response is, Okay, have the Jews fast for three days and pray for my success, and I go in. And as we say, the rest is history. She went in, the bad guy, Haman, his decree, his, he, was hung, he was hanged with his ten sons. Ahasuerus turned around, he became a good guy. Mordechai, who became the advisor to the king, and eventually and the Jewish people were saved, and really the world was saved. Because as we know that hatred and anti-Semitism only starts with the Jews, it never ends with the Jews. And so this was something that really, we are the, the Jewish people are the canary in the coal mine. But the point here is this was the Queen Esther moment, where she had to stand up against the world, the king of the world, at great risk in order to set morality straight. We live in a very, very, very dangerous world. We live in a world of great moral confusion. You have Hamas, you have all the sympathizers, which are right on ULV's campus, you know, several times last week. And they are around all over, the, in, in Congress, in the Senate, all over the place. And they are standing up saying, oh, you know what, listen, a little you know, ceasefire, oh, a little relief to the people that are suffering in the war. Hamas is open. Their charter is to wipe out the state of Israel. Their charter is to kill every Jew, including you and I. If they could, they would do it right now. Right now, they would do it if they, if they could. And their charter is straight up that if you don't live according to the tenets of the Muslim Brotherhood, then you will be destroyed. The least confused people on the planet are Hamas, because they are straight with their mission, and they're open, and they're honest with what they want to do. The rest of the world is confused. For some reason, we don't, so many of us don't believe them, don't believe what they would do. Just, I don't believe. So they, they, some say the miracle of Purim was the Jews actually believed the anti-Semites when they said they would kill them. And therefore, the Jews got together in unity, and they prayed, and they fasted. And then God brought deliverance and allowed the Jews to take vengeance on the anti-Semites in order to, to protect themselves. And we've got to stand up in our world today and know that every one of us has our Queen Esther moment, where we have to let our voices be heard, and we have to be strong, and we have to be clear for that which is right and that which is just. And it is very sad when we watch others miss their Queen Esther moment and allow the, the forces of evil and confusion to rule this world. 
The Almighty should bless this council, bless the people here, bless all of us with the courage and the insight to know what is right and to act upon that which we know is true. Amen. And Councilman Creer, oh. you want to invite and make a notice as we come on down for ceremonies. I do. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, we are blessed to have a uh, group of ladies who are here today with us, and we're very happy to welcome the Las Vegas alumni chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated who are here. Uh, ladies, please stand for me. Uh, their president, Dr. Rebecca Rogers, and their social action chair, Dr. Tia Mathis Coleman. You know, through social action, Delta Sigma Theta promotes leadership, advocacy, and empowerment to promote social and policy changes. We are very happy to welcome you here to the People's House, the Deltas, and we continue to support and uplift our great community in all the work that you do. Thank you. As a member of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated, a uh, member of the Divine Nine, I welcome you, and thank you all for coming to being engaged in what's going on in social action in our community and civic engagement. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. We are loaded up here. Whoa. Somebody carried all that good morning. <laughs> okay, this is our ceremonial portion of the agenda. And for our first item, I'd like to invite our Parks, Recreation, Cultural Affairs Director, Mrs. Maggie Blasser, to join us up here. And Maggie's been here a long time, 21 years at the city, 19 to 20. When you're having fun, it doesn't matter, right? Right. Um, our employees, as you know, strive to meet our values of being kind, committed, and smart. And they work to build our community to make life better. I'm so proud to announce that the employee of this month of March is Christina Hayes. So come on down, Christina. <laughs> and Tina has a fan club. Look, look, look here. Congratulations. <laughs> Beautiful. Okay, Tina's a business specialist. And believe it or not, what month did you come in? What, what? What month did you come May. in? In May. 99. Lucky you. Six months after Oscar was mayor. He hired well, I must say, you lucky lady to put up with him. Uh, during Tina's time with the city, she's issued close to 10,000 film permits and had a front row seat to all the filming for movies and television here in Las Vegas. Some notable productions she's been involved in. And did you have a cameo in all of these? I know Oscar tried. I had to ask for Oscar several times. <laughs> and he kept saying, I need to be in this. I need to. He was prepping for Casino. Okay, some of the shows uh, that she's been involved in, Hangover, the Jason Bourne films, The Sopranos, U2's Atomic City music video, 
CSI Las Vegas hacks, obliterated diners, drive-ins, and dives, and you know that because he's here all the time, LVCVA commercials, and bar rescue, and that's just a few of them. The city constantly receives such great feedback about Tina's services and willingness to do whatever it takes to get the job done, even in the face of last-minute requests and changes, which you know come about in the fluid nature of film production. She has saved production shoots and money because of her work ethic and ability to be so adaptable. In fact, it was the staff at the Nevada Film Office that nominated Tina for this honor because of her unwavering dedication to film and video productions in Las Vegas. What an exciting job she has had. I understand, sadly, you will soon be retired. You're not gray. You have to be gray to retire. <laughs> I guess she's had enough of us. But I must say, we'll miss your smiling face, and we wish you the best in your future. But before you get a chance to speak, a wonderful Maggie, just I know you think the world of her, too. So, Please. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. So Tina joined the city May 30th, 1999, and she's ending her career by being acknowledged with the highest honor we give city employees. So I just think that says so much about her that she's giving it her all to the very end. Uh, I do want to give a shout out to Public Works because it seems a little bit unfair that Parks, Rec, and Cultural Affairs is getting this award. <laughs> Since Tina was with that department 24 plus years, so thanks Public Works for letting us have Tina at the very end. Um, three words come to mind when I think about Tina, and that's dedication, work ethic, and customer service. Um, she's always made herself available to help others. She's been a longtime member of the Employee Recognition Committee. That's really important to her. Since joining our special events permit team, she's been helping us transition from Hanson to Infor and also helping with this drone and parks policy that no one seems to want to work on. So <laughs> Tina took that on, which is very helpful for us. And she's been training people to do her job when she retires, which is what you want to see with any employee. Um, She's shown time and time again how much she cares about customer service. She's always had a standard of responding to film and special event requests within one business day. She's always quick to fill in gaps when people are on vacation or when they leave for other jobs. And when Tina worked in the city's compliance ambassador program during the pandemic, she was one of the last staff members to be in the program because of her work ethic and because of her customer service. And in that year's performance evaluation, Tina wrote, while this year, while this last year has been challenging, I'm always happy to be a city employee and learn new things, which is always what you want to hear. So, Tina, thank you for all you've done for the city of Las Vegas over the last 25 years, and thank you for giving us your best work every day. Thank you for this acknowledgement. It truly is an honor. I'm so pleased to be part of the City of Las Vegas family. Everyone who I've worked with has always lifted me up and showed that they believed in me. I love my department, Parks, Recreation, and Cultural Affairs, but growing up in public works gave me so much, a true foundation, and most importantly, a husband. <laughs> <laughs> really, though, um, the teams I have worked for, worked with over the years, truly are family, and it's that family that made this possible. They gave me the tools and the courage to do the best I can do. I would like to also thank my outside work family, which include my mom and dad, my husband Tom, daughters Christian and Amanda, their husbands Alex and Michael, and of course my new employers as of next week, my grandchildren, <laughs> Ava, Eli, Owen, and four-week-old Calvin, who made it here today. Thank you. Could you all family stand up, please, so everybody can see you. And Alex, I know you're a firefighter, so thank you. Did you have a small fire that you got to meet him? Is that how you arranged that? No. <laughs> no. Well, thank you. Congratulations. So everybody, 
you are family forever. Well, we have this wonderful, beautiful oh, plaque for you, recognizing you as the employee of the month. And of course, your name will be on the sign if we can find the sign, Mr. Riggleman, as we're going to make it bigger and better on the corner of Maine and Clark. We'd appreciate it. Thank you. But what a absolutely phenomenal employee you've been these many years. We know you'll be happy. Everybody that seems to be retiring looks like they're 10 years younger. <laughs> so not that you need that. So how about a picture up front? Sure. We do that? Yep. Okay. Yeah. You want me to hold this? Okay. Yeah. Yes. Hold oh, yes. Okay. Right. Yep. Right. Yeah, that's okay. Because we've got the bigger one. Congrats. Thank you. Nice job. Great seat. And Tina, these are yours for yes. posterity. Thank <laughs> and thank you, Maggie. And thank you, everybody that's been involved in both our public works and parks and, re re um, parks and recreation. So now, wow, it's all yours, Councilwoman Seaman. Thank you. Uh, so, I'm so excited to be here to talk about an amazing group of people. During my time on the City Council, I've had the opportunity to work with so many fantastic rescues. I'm always in awe of how these amazing people work tirelessly to love and care for our animals, giving their time and money to ensure that as many animals as possible find loving forever homes. Today, I'm just going to honor a few outstanding animal rescues that have profoundly impacted our community. S during the last four and a half years that I've been on this council, when we have a problem, they are the first to let us know, but they're also the first to step up and do something. They do this with unconditional love and therefore go above and beyond to serve and protect our animals. While we celebrate the achievements of these exemplary organizations, it is essential to remember that many other animal rescues in our city do fantastic work every day. Whether small or large, contrib contributing different roles, each entity plays a vital role in ensuring the well-being of our animal companions. United in different roles, our love and dedication can and have improved the lives of our furry friends and created a more compassion and humane society. I want to celebrate all the hard work of our local animal advocates and rescues in our city for their dedication, unwavering compassion, and relentless pursuit of a better world for animals. May their efforts inspire us all to do our part in protecting and caring for those who cannot speak for themselves. So thank you to our city's animal rescues for your invaluable contribution. May your work serve as a testament of the power and love and compassion in improving the world for all living creatures. So to save time, I'm gonna ask each organization uh, to come up and you're all recognized in your proclamations for your specific work but to save time, I'm only going to read one. So can I have No Kill Las Vegas Bryce Henderson come up? <laughs> Nevada SPCA Lori Heron. The Farm Sharon Linson Bart. Bunnies Matter Dave Schweiger. Heaven Can Wait, Rachel Bergen. Lost and Found Animal Foundation, Arena. A Home for Spot, Diana England. Yeah, come on over here. Forgotten Dogs, Mary LG. Animal Network, Marisa Flagg. So let me find a small one that I'll read. Uh, 
So I'm going to start with a home for Spot. Whereas a home for Spot with boundless compassion and dedication has provided refuge care and love for countless dogs in need, offering them a second chance at a happy and fulfilling life. And whereas their commitment to rescuing, rehabilitating, and reforming dogs of all breeds, ages, and backgrounds reflects their deep-seated belief in the inherent value and dignity of every canine companion. And whereas a home for spots tireless efforts to provide medical care, training, and socialization for dogs in need serve as a beacon of hope and compassion, demonstrating the transform transformative power of love and empathy. And whereas the steadfast advocacy for the rights and welfare of dogs coupled with their support of the Pups on Parole program at the Women's Correctional Facility, exemplify the highest standards of integrity and compassion in the realm of animal rescue and advocacy. And now, therefore, be it proclaimed that the mayor and the Las Vegas City Council declare March 20th, 24, as a home for spot day. Now, I'm going to let you say a few words. But we have a timeline, so just a few words if whoever wants to say something. So I'll start over here. Anybody want to say? Assign someone. Okay. <clears throat> okay. I just want, I have amazing volunteers, over 50, and I want to thank them all. They're, we couldn't do what we do without them. And of course, the supporters, we get supporters from all over the country and out of the country. So. We couldn't do what we do without all the help from the outside. Um, one thing I do want to say is uh, we need to stop the illegal breeding problem in the city. That will go a long way to helping all the rescues. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, <clears throat> Bryce Henderson with No Kill Las Vegas. Uh, I want to thank the council and uh, particularly Victoria Seaman for all the efforts she's done to help animals in the community, and also all the rescues that are here today. Uh, I brought my dog Arbor because she was the inspiration to start our nonprofit No Kill Las Vegas because she came from the shelter, we had adopted her from the shelter that we ended up spending the next years putting pressure on to change. And uh, in the beginning it was just myself, my uh, ex-wife, and Arbor, and her Facebook page, our dog's Facebook page. And uh, through that, we were able to share the truth about what was really happening at the shelter. But none of that would have meant anything if it wasn't for all of you sharing and liking the posts and calling your elected officials and coming to our protests and coming to these meetings, as a matter of fact. And uh, I would say the work is not done yet. There's still more to do. Um, we, we now will have a new um, a contract to come up for bid for the animal shelter. So uh, we need to make sure we can find a new organization that is willing to run the shelter. And then we also need to make sure that the current contract is enforced. But I will say this, it is a definitely a new day in Las Vegas when an institution that used to tell us to sit down and be quiet is telling us, asking us to stand up and be recognized. So thank you. Uh, th I'm Rachel Berger, and I'm the executive director for Heaven Can Wait Animal Society. Thank you so much for this recognition. Um, for the past 24 years, Heaven Can Wait Animal Society has had the really um, awesome privilege of providing veterinary, um, high-quality, low-cost veterinary services to um, animals in our community. Um, so that's a really specific niche that we fill in the community, and we're really, really uh, privileged to be able to provide those services. So spay and neuter um, is at the heart of what we do. Um, and um, I am joined by my staff here from the Heaven Can Wait Animal Society. Um, and in recognition of it being um, Women's um, History Month, um, I want to note that my entire staff is all female. <laughs> um, so girl power. Um, so thank you so much for this recognition. And we um, are very privileged and honored to work with all of the um, animal rescue um, organizations to provide um, life-saving veterinary care um, to the animals in our community. So thank you so much. Thank you. We're very grateful to all of you. And how about, oh. No, she's good. Okay. 
So I'll have a picture if we want to come up front here and stand sideways, I guess, to get us all in. We'll go right in front of the uh, podium here. And this is good because then you can come right here. Perfect. <laughs> you and me. Okay. There. Oh, sorry. There. We're good. I'm not very good with pictures. That's okay. <laughs> okay. And if you can see Kira, she can see you. She's going to move you around a bit. <laughs> She's trying to get oh, the get dog. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. well, wonderful, and thank you again, all. And everyone that's come here on behalf of you and working with you, thank you all thank very you. much. Thank you, Councilwoman. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we will take a five-minute recess right now. Thank you. So we can get technology caught up with us. See that? Right. You see my you see my calves? Huh? Are you looking at my calf? Excuse me. No, you're good. Hey, Gabby. How are you doing? How are you doing? It's I'm good doing to see good, you. I'm doing good, thank you.
Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to go ahead and resume the rest of our council meeting. Okay. One, two, three, four, good. Okay. Okay, this is agenda item seven, public comment during this portion of the agenda. I'm going softly. <laughs> okay. Public comment during this portion of the agenda must be limited to matters on the agenda for action. The amount of time any single speaker is allowed may be limited. All comments made will be cross-referenced to those specific items in the agenda. If anyone has submitted a speaker card or who wishes to speak under this first uh, public speaking comment period, uh, please come to the podium, state your name for the record. It's your opportunity to address council, but the council will not be responding or engaging in dialogue. We'll set the time at one minute, but realize at the end of our council, there's another opportunity to speak and it will be a longer period. So please, your name, sir, please. Hi, my name is Christian Salmon. I'd like to speak on item 42. Uh, bill 2024-8. I'm speaking on behalf of my neighbors in their place. Uh, we'd like to ask for some of these items to be changed. First off, drop religious um, or church um, less than or more than five acres uh, for this zoning. It's regarding CV zoning. Uh, there is currently, a li it's lifting the, uh, the height uh, limit. Currently it's 35 uh, feet. Then it goes to unlimited. We'd like that uh, struck off. Also, placement of telecom towers in or near the R zone properties, whether they're operated by private or uh, government properties. Also, um, this is an NRP area. Um, this bill, um, people that have purchased a property for planning commission agenda item 24-0072 did not consult the neighbors. They've been working at this for a long time. And now we have them coming in and saying, you know what, screw this. We want to do it our way. They have not consulted us. And that's discourteous. That's not what we're supposed to do as neighbors. And we're supposed to just go along with that. That's, I, I implore everybody, please listen to us. We are going to get louder. Thank you and appreciate your coming down and staying within the one minute commentary. Thank you, you've made your record. Okay, anyone else? Please come forward, state your name for the record. And if you would, cite the agenda item to which you're referring. Hi, my name's hi. Nicole Kelly. I was here on Monday, so hi again to some of you guys. Um, I want to speak to item number 42, also the 2024-8. Um, one of my main concerns is that this removes 1906.60, um, which gets rid of the two-story and 35-foot residen residential adjacency requirement. I don't know if you guys have done a study, like an urban development study of what will happen with that 10 years or 25 years from now. Will you see Verizon Wireless because they're civic? Instead of revitalizing or rebuilding a building downtown and remodeling it, will they go, hey, I can get really cheap acreage down in the southwest in this neighborhood. Let me put my five-story office building here, you know, where it really isn't something that belongs and you'd rather see them somewhere like a downtown or in the middle of town. Like, I, 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 my curiosity was if a study has been done for any of that. Also, what's the pent-up demand for cell towers? Like, you're seeing in town now that we have, you know, competitors to Cox. You've got LVNet. You've got Verizon Wireless doing home internet now. Thank you. They will run out of cell tower Thank space you. and they'll Thank need to build you. more. Anyone else, please come forward, state your name for the record. Good morning, my name is Renee Newman. I am a resident in the same area as the bill is being presented today, 2024-8 and I wanted to voice my opinion opposing that bill also, mainly for the reason that being a native Nevadan and my husband also 
Native Nevadans. We've moved slowly to the north, moving from the city into the county island, and that purpose was for the reason that it is rural, and our fear is the same as she was mentioning in the past here, that the property and the height restrictions, and right now we're a rural environment, we hike and trail and go to the mountain and enjoy coming out and seeing our desert that we enjoy living within. And we're just afraid that those height restrictions will be removed and the traffic that will in include and the style of the buildings and whatnot that will be brought in with this ordinance change. And right now, we live in that island on for that reason, just the fact that it is rural and living here all our lives, you've seen all the changes that have gone on here. and. Again, I just hope that this does not pass. I know this is a bill you introduced, which I was literally surprised since we are county and you are city, but we're an island. So that makes it a little bit different to do the presentation. And no, we, we as neighbors and people that have lived here our entire lives, we know that there's changes. We know that the city's growing and spreading out. But at the same time, there has to be areas where people can keep their their style of living with their animals and whatever else we have. Thank you. So Thank I do you oppose this bill. Thank you. You've Thank made you. the record. Thank you. Is there anyone else who wishes to speak under public comment, please? Good morning. My name is uh, Brinton Marsden. Uh, I live in the uh, RNP, and I also oppose this, this bill. Uh, to give you perspective, my wife and I retired from long careers in law enforcement and looked for a quiet rural area to retire with our animals with acreage. And we found such a place in the Lone Mountain Rural Natural Preserve, which had the interlocal agreement with the city and the county, which said that the area was to never have street lights, sidewalks, gutters, etc. Properties were limited to a half acre or more with single family homes and height limitations. With this backdoor go-around of the interlocal agreement, it will destroy the agreement, and it should be noted that the, the agreement is due to be uh, reassessed in 2026. Why the rush to repeal the zoning restrictions before the agreement is renegotiated? Unless they know it, it won't fly. Ask yourself those questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone else? Okay, we'll move on to agenda item eight. For possible action, any items from the 930 session that the council staff and or applicant wish to be stricken, table withdrawn, or held in abeyance to a future meeting may be brought forward and acted upon at this time. Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mayor. I have five items. Item number 38, a resolution between the City of Las Vegas Redevelopment Agency, Ragsdale 1977 Trust, and Richard Lamb and Infinite mm -hmm. Holdings. And action is requested to strike this by staff. Item number 40, bill number 2024-6, staff has requested this item be stricken. Item number 41, bill number 2024-7, staff has requested this item be stricken. 49A through 49B, 23-0629, SUP1, SDR1, applicant owners, IHC Health Services on 7.66 acres at 510 South Rampart. There's an abeyance request by the applicant to the 417 2024 City Council meeting. And items 50A through 50B, 23-0645, SUP1, SUP2, applicant owner is at downtown Sanchez on 0.16 acres at 623 South 4th Street. There's an abeyance request by the applicant to the 417 2024 City Council meeting. That will be my motion. Okay, there's a motion. Please vote and please post. And that motion carries. We'll move on to agenda item nine, possible action to approve the final minutes by reference to the February 21st, 2024 regular city council meeting. Mayor Pro Tem, may I have a motion, please? Move to approve the February 21st, 2024 city council meeting minutes. Thank you. There's a motion to approve agenda item nine. Please vote and please post. That motion carries. We'll move on to agenda item 10 through 37 because we have stricken item number 38 just a moment ago. Uh, and these are on the consent agenda considered to be routine, are recommended for approval by the departments, may be enacted in one motion. Note that the record should 
to reflect my abstention on item 16 as it pertains to the medical marijuana industry and one of my sons involved in that industry. I'll be voting on all other items. So Mayor Pro Tem may have a motion for the consent agendas 10 through 37. Madam Mayor, move to approve items 10 through 37 with the noted abstention on item 16. Thank you very much. This motion, please vote and please post. And that carries. We'll move on to agenda item 39, hearing and discussion for possible action regarding complaint for disciplinary action against KNK Property Manage LLC DBA Travelers Bed and Breakfast in Hope Kwan, managing member whose place of business is located 1502 South Las Vegas Boulevard, Las Vegas, Nevada, 89101, is holder of hotel license number G63-05293 and residence hostel single room license number G63-054. 79 for violations of Las Vegas Municipal Code in Ward 3 with Councilwoman Diaz. Good morning. Morning, Your Honor. Good morning. Uh, Deputy City Attorney John Curtis with me, Deputy City Attorney Paul Matta, representing the City of Las Vegas. Also, also at the podium is Business Licensing Manager Darcy Adelbay Hurd. Uh, we're ready to proceed with the hearing today. I believe the uh, licensee is in the audience and we would ask them to come forward if they would please. Good morning, thank you for coming down. Morning, Madam Mayor, City Council. Uh, my name is Attorney John Lee, bar number 1340, appearing on behalf of KNK <coughs> Management Properties and Mrs. Uh, Miss, um, Miss, uh, let me get the name right. Hope Kwan. Hope, Hope Kwan Chung. Correct. Mrs. Chung is here. Good morning. Thank you. Yeah. We're ready to proceed, Your Honor. And the gentleman to your right, sir. Mr. Yes, Your Honor, that's our property manager, Mr. Anthony Owens. He'll be addressing some of the Thank concerns. You. And for a brief moment, could I ask you to just take your mask down for one moment so we have full visual of who you are. Thank you so much, and please feel free to go back up there. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Your Honor. Yes, Mr. Kirk. Madam Mayor, members of the Council, if I may, what we'd like to do this morning is we have a significant amount of evidence to present. I, I'd like to make a very short sort of opening statement, as it were, and then turn it over to our business licensing people and representatives of the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department for their factual analysis basis and, uh, and, uh, and uh, the litany of facts and circumstances which bring us here today. But uh, to begin with, I'd just like to make a short statement to summarize what I think the council is going to hear you know, over the next uh, 20 or 30 minutes. What brings us here today is a situation which is out of control on Las Vegas Boulevard, 1502 Las Vegas Boulevard South, the corner of 3rd and Utah, at a, at a business, the licensee known as uh, Traveler's Bed and Breakfast. The licensee is licensed for short-term rentals as a hotel and as a hostel. It uh, has 22 units, as a hostel has four units, that is rented as a hotel for slightly longer stays, but it's, it, the license is only for short-term stays, not for long-term rentals of any kind, okay? All of it is over, what has brought us here today is what started out being just a, a normal bed and breakfast maybe 10 years ago has turned into this hotbed of criminality, which has escalated to the point today that over the last eight months, the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department had no choice but to declare this uh, business and the, and the surrounding area a chronic nuisance and ask for an emergency shutdown. Because of those circumstances, we, were, we also expedited this disciplinary complaint seeking disciplinary action by this council against the licensee. All of these, this, uh, for lack of a better term, what, what's was once a law-abiding business has turned into this den of iniquity, which will be outlined by factually by Darcy Adelbay Heard and the Metropolitan Police Department. 
And at the risk of sounding melodramatic, we're talking about drugs, open drug usage, open drug trafficking, illegal narcotics, overdoses, stabbings, shootings, and homicides, all of which, and I'm plural, not singular, all of which have escalated in the last eight months to the point that we have come to this forum today to bring the owner to account, to hold the owner to account for what is certainly a, a business which is attracting the most unsavory and egregious form of criminal activity. I'm going to remind the council as they hear the, hear the evidence today that this business sits on the very cusp of the arts district. Uh, and it is on the southern tip at 1502 Las Vegas Boulevard South, which en is the entrance and the, the beginning of the Arts District, which is a rapidly regentrifying area in Las Vegas, an area which is soon to be, a sh if it isn't already, a showplace for the best of urban Las Vegas. And right on the edge of it sits this business where there have been hundreds of calls for service, homicides, stabbings, shootings, and open drug activity to the point where Metro, the fire department, and business licensing had no alternative but to bring this disciplinary complaint here today. So I will ask this council at the end of the presentation for a, uh, to move for a, uh, a, here, a, a finding that this is a public nuisance and because it's operated as a public nuisance that the business license be revoked but I will make that presentation at the conclusion of the factual evidence brought, uh, you will hear today. And with that, I'll bring it over, I'll turn it over to Darcy Adelbay Heard, who will set forth the litany of both Las Vegas Municipal Code sections and the violations thereof, which brought forth this disciplinary complaint. From there, we'll go to the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department, who have several representatives here to make a presentation. And if I might ask you, is the operation at this moment closed? It has been closed since March 7th, Your Honor. Okay, thank you. So, under an emergency metro shutdown, and the representatives, of course, will be here uh, to, to outline the factual basis for that, and of course, the, the licensee themselves and their representatives will be speaking after we conclude. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, G good morning, Mayor, Council, Darcy by heard for the record, uh, business licensing manager. Um, as John has stated, uh, this is for K&K property management doing business as Traveler's Bed and Breakfast. So um, over the past few years, uh, Traveler's Bed and Breakfast has been found non-compliant upon inspection from business licensing. Uh, we've conducted several inspections, including joint inspections with Fire, Metro, and Code Enforcement. Uh, despite ongoing efforts, we have continued to find violations ranging from failure to maintain adequate records and issues with allowing them to have extended stays. Their license um, is for a hotel with four rooms and a hostel with 20, 22 rooms, which shares one bathroom. When the applicant applied for the business, um, it was for public accommodations, renting, room renting business, hotel will only rent rooms A, B, E, A, B, E and D, hostel daily rentals only. The licenses were conditioned by our planning and zoning, uh, indicating daily rental period is not allowed more than one week. The licenses were uh, granted on July 29th, 2015. Um, I'm going to quickly go through uh, the business licensing efforts and the violations found, um, and then I'll turn it over to Metro. So March 2019, uh, we did three inspections, March 15th, 19th, and the 27th. We did find violations of LVMC 6.46140, and 6.0206. We found them to be non-compliant with the public register. After educating the owner, they started to implement an electronic system. This is for their check-in, check-out system. We also found an unlicensed coin-operating laundry uh, business on site, but on subsequent vis uh, visits, we found that they removed the laundry and they started to implement that system, so the case was closed. Uh, moving forward to November of 2021, uh, we did receive a citizen complaint, November 9th, 2021. The complaint indicated that there was criminal activities, including drugs, prostitution, robbery with a firearm, and stabbing at the premises. So we did a joint inspection with our fire uh, prevention. Uh, the owner and staff were present. We found the same violations as before, uh, violations of uh, 6.46100, 150, and 6.02. 
uh, indicating that they had people staying extended stays. Um, they also, uh, the complaint also indicated that there was an unlicensed hair salon operating out of one of the rooms, but we were unable to substantiate that because the tenant was not um, at the room when, when we were there. A follow-up inspection um, verified that two of the, the tenants that um, had, had been living there longer than five months were being evicted. And um, joint, uh, the joint inspection did find also that there were fire violations, nine, nine fire safety violations. We issued correction notices and uh, issued some fees. Um, also, fire did follow up and uh, they did correct the items. And then in 2023, um, in April, Metro did issue a chronic nuisance letter to the owner. There were five um, activities constituting a chron chronic nuisance um, identified from the dates of February 25th, 2023 to March 31st, 31st of 2023, which were violent crimes and narcotic activity. In, uh, there, the owner did not address that letter. In June, um, we did an inspection, the owner was present and we found the violation again for uh, 6.46, 100 and 150 for failure to maintain adequate records. Um, Metro also amended their chronic nuisance letter and added the additional uh, incidents that had happened from, the, from March on until June. And in November of 23, we did a joint inspection with business licensing, um, compliance audit, Metro, which was the downtown area command and fire. Uh, continue to find the failure to maintain the adi adequate inspections and the, the uh, extended stays. And we issued another correction notice with some reinspection fees. Uh, there was also fire uh, safety notices issued at that inspection as well. Then uh, in February of this year, on February 13th, co uh, compliance and audit went back out. And um, upon um, Upon, uh, I'm sorry, they surveyed, our team surveyed from across the street first and they witnessed several people leaving the travelers through the side gate and walking behind the alley where they were loitering. But then upon entering for inspection, hostel, hotel staff provided the registration books with verbiage stating a maximum stay with, of 28 days with a return to the prop property requiring a minimum of two or four days, which again is still in violation of no more than seven days. Staff indicated they had a resident who had been there as a good guest for three years, but had been um, to the constable to gain evictions for some of the others. Business licensing staff explained again that the license does not allow for extended stays. Violations again were found for the unlawful activity, doing business without a license for the extended stays and failure to maintain adequate records. We did another joint inspection with downtown area command, fire prevention, building and safety and code enforcement and the owner was present. Found um, again the violations and issued another notice and civil fines and reinspection fees. Um, and then coming into this month, March of 24, uh, we went out on March 5th, did the inspections, no fines were issued. We did find also the employees were living on site um, which was a violation of the extended stay for over seven days and still failing to maintain the adequate room records. The next day on March 6th, we brought before you uh, the disciplinary complaint to set the hearing for today. On March 7th, Metro did issue the emergency suspension um, and we accompanied them along with neighborhood services. March 13th, uh, we went with Metro to verify that they had closed and they were no longer operating. But we did find um, that people were living on premise still, more than six days. Multiple people were observed um, uh, living there in violation of the emergency suspension. And so we did issue a $500 civil fine um, and reinspection fees. And then we went back out the next day to verify that they had vacated, but we found yet again they were still there. And so they were assessed a $1,000 civil fine and reinspection fees. Um, then on the 18th, which is this week, and the 19th, we went back out two times yesterday, um, but there were no apparent violations observed. Uh, we were out with Metro on the 18th and the 19th, and on the afternoon, we just did an observation. Although we couldn't substantiate that there was violations, there was activity, we could not tell whether or not people were actually living there because it was the middle of the day. Okay, um, on some of these um, inspections, our audit team, was there with them um, and we're trying to assess how to 
uh, take care of their books. An audit was done. Um, the room tax uh, audit uh, went from January 1st through December 31st, and a finding was found that they um, do owe $8,798.61 in uh, room tax fees, uh, for unpaid room tax fees. I just wanted to highlight this is just uh, more non-compliance of the business, but not a basis for this hearing. Um, and so with that, I'll turn it over to Lieutenant Kamal Bernstein um, with Metro to take you through the, the things that Metro um, has found that led into the emergency order. Thank you. Mayor and Council, for the record, my name is Jesse Colin Bernstein, and I'm a lieutenant with the Downtown Area Command. Um, I also have with me Captain Brandon Norris, who's the Bureau Commander for Downtown Area Command, as well as the previous Bureau Commander, uh, Adam, excuse me, uh, Brandon Norris, and the Chief of our area, uh, Chris Holmes, just to show the importance of what we're going to present today. Um, so I'll start to go through um, some significant events that deal with uh, violent criminal acts, and then I'll deal with some narcotics offenses as well. <coughs> Starting in uh, February of 2024, there was a, a homicide, a murder event, which occurred where a uh, male was located on the second floor bleeding from his abdomen when the officers arrived. Uh, the crime scene was located, and there was a blood trail that was discovered coming from the bottom of the stairs of the traveler's entrance, leading into where the victim was located. There was cameras um, that were reviewed, and they showed that the uh, someone stepped over the victim and obtained a mop and bucket and began to actually mop up the blood um, in real time, disposing of the evidence in the crime scene before police were able to arrive and determine what was occurring. Officers later located a suspect to match the description, and he was uh, subsequently arrested and confessed to that stabbing. That person subsequently died, um, therefore making it a murder. The witnesses that were um, interviewed by our detectives did make a point of noting that the suspect was a drug dealer at the Travelers prior to him being arrested um, for the homicide. In January of 2024, there was a, uh, a stabbing uh, that occurred at Utah and 3rd Street. That's the cross streets um, directly next to the business. The victim was actually staying at Travelers prior to being um, stabbed. He was staying, he was on the south entrance of the hotel and the suspect had actually accused him of stealing. Uh, the suspect subsequently pulled out a pocket knife and stabbed the victim in the upper left arm. That suspect fled and that case is still open. In October of 2023, there was another homicide event, a murder. That again occurred at the intersection of 3rd and Utah, which is directly next to that business. Uh, the body of the victim was actually on the pavement with gunshot wounds to the head and neck area, uh, and they were in such grave condition they were pronounced deceased on scene. They weren't even transported to a medical facility. There is surveillance video that was reviewed, and that shows the suspect fleeing the area. Uh, again, of note, the victim was a known drug dealer. Um, detectives located video of another event that had actually occurred pr uh, four days prior to the murder. In that event, the uh, victim of the homicide was in a room with a female. Uh, the suspect that actually perpetrated the murder was with another male. That male had a firearm. They forcibly entered the residence. So there was a home invasion that occurred at Travelers, which was unreported. Four days later, we have a homicide where that same victim is then uh, killed. In June of 2023, there is another uh, battery with a deadly weapon, a shooting. They located the victim with a gunshot wound to his buttocks area. Um, witnesses told our detectives that the suspect had gotten to an altercation at the entrance of the Traveler's Inn. That altercation started within the business and continued at the entrance. The victim was uh, inside the Traveler's to get a room and was approached by the two suspects. They found video from surrounding businesses, but the Travelers had a limited uh, view of that altercation due to the placement of the cameras. It wasn't an all-encompassing view, so it was difficult to use their video. Moving on to some uh, narcotics activity that um, has been, uh, there's been search warrants taking place on the property. Start one on June of 2023. During that search warrant, there was fentanyl, meth, uh, crack cocaine, heroin, and U.S. currency recovered. Uh, also of note, during that search warrant, they found multiple credit cards and identification that were in someone else's name, not the suspect, so there was fraud activities occurring. In October of 2023, during another narcotics search warrant, uh, DTAX Flex officers, which is a plainclothes team of officers that work for Downtown Area Command, located a male selling narcotics at the Travelers. 
The reason that they targeted this person is because he had previously been somebody selling narcotics within the Travelers. He had gotten a little smarter, uh, so to speak, and realized that he could drive down there, sell narcotics, and then go back to another residence to avoid uh, hopefully being prosecuted. They made the connection, they did surveillance, and found that he was selling at the Travelers. Um, they served a search warrant at his residence in North Las Vegas. When they did, they found uh, methamphetamine, um, different types of fentanyl, both in powder and pill form, as well as crack cocaine, $546 in U.S. currency, as well as two firearms. Another thing is I was on scene during that that's important to note is that there was a, a difference in time from when the SWAT team arrived until they were to make entry inside that structure. There was uh, evidence, of, evidence, be, excuse me, evidence of things being destroyed within that house, so I don't think the full scope of what he possessed that day is obviously represented within this picture. Um, and on that arrest, there was actually, or on that search warrant, there was two arrests made, one of that particular person, one of a parole violation that female had helped during the narcotic sales on site at the Travelers. The next search warrant was in December of 2023. This occurred at the Travelers property. When the SWAT team began to arrive in the area, a person purporting to be security actually shut and locked the gate in an effort to deter them from entering or prevent them from entering. Obviously our SWAT team did make entry but delayed their entry. The suspect as a result of that was able to run from the bungalow area which is on the right of that top picture. The area referred to as the hotels where they have four rooms into the main building and then moved between many different rooms and this was viewed on security camera. It took a significant amount of time for us to figure out where he was and actually take him into custody because of that. But during that search warrant, they found marijuana, uh, fentanyl powder, a purported fentanyl pill, uh, methamphetamine, um, some additional prescription pills and $93 in US currency. That same suspect um, that denied entry to our SWAT team to the property for a lawful search warrant came around again. Um, we had officers from Convention Center Area Command that were doing some follow-up on a case in their area. They observed that same gentleman in the property. When he left, he left in a vehicle. They made a vehicle stop away, and in that vehicle they found uh, methamphetamine, cocaine, fentanyl, heroin, MDMA or ecstasy, marijuana, as well as U.S. currency. So it's, uh, it's the same person that has been a repeat problem that was staying on the property. He was one of the people that was staying over the allotted time and had acted as security and was uh, involved in drug sales multiple times. Just to speak to some of the uh, events that we've responded to as well on a medical side, between January 1 and March 7, there's seven known events. What I'll preface this with is this is tied directly to that specific address. A lot of the events will occur on street corners and things of that nature. We didn't, we just specifically use this address. But those seven events with uh, narcotics related overdoses just from metros, that does not include uh, fire a response at all whatsoever. What I will say is the day that we um, approached the business to do the emergency shutdown, there's a person directly adjacent to the business in medical distress using narcotics that had to be transported by Las Vegas Fire and Rescue. Um, because our officers approached and, and found her in medical distress. So that was literally the day of the emergency shutdown. Just to speak to some of the chronic nuisance letters and ways that we've officially put the business and Ms. Kwan on uh, notice of the issues that we've had. In March of 2023, there's a chronic nuisance letter. In April of 2023, another chronic nuisance letter. And in February of 2024, a chronic nuisance letter. That one was specifically signed uh, in person with Ms. Kwan at Downtown Area Command. Looking to some calls for service data to discuss how many times we've responded to this particular property. There's overall um, roughly 245 CAD events, and we'll break those down a little more, but that's an overarching uh, number of calls when you Explain look at- Explain what CAD, CAD. Yeah, Sorry, CAD events is computer-aided dispatch. It's uh, basically an acronym. Every call that will come in to our dispatch center, our officers will create, uh, will have an event number assigned to it, and that's where we pull that. When you break it down a little more, uh, there's 102 calls for service, so that's somebody calling the police department asking for help, not for the fire department, not for medical resources, but specifically for police assistance. When you look a little further down, we have 74 officer-initiated stops. What's important to note about this, this is a very small property, but we are going and being proactive 74 times within the August to March time frame. That's markedly more than you would find on properties of this size in other places. So. There's a reason for that. Obviously, there's some criminality occurring, there's some narcotics activity, and there's violence, so we're concerned for the community and the people that are staying there. But we're also making an attempt to root out that criminal activity and stop that from occurring and showing presence. 
And that will uh, conclude my presentation unless anybody has any questions. And uh, if not, Captain Steele, I know, would like to make a statement uh, as well. I'm not sure if it's appropriate at this time, Mr. Curtis, but I'm wondering if we're allowed to find out, does the owner have any other properties? Mm -hmm. And if the answer is yes, within the city confines, have there been violations on those properties? And those may not be germane or allowed, but. I don't think she owns, I, I think that's been looked into, Your Honor, and I do not believe there is any other properties owned within, within the, the city, city of Los Within the city, we have no jurisdiction elsewhere, but uh, within the city confines. Within the city confines, <laughs> uh, the city has She owns no other property. I was speaking to a residential property, not a commercial property, yeah, yes. so. She lives in the city of Las Vegas, and this is her investment property in the city of Las Vegas. Okay. That's but my to understanding. To your knowledge, there are no other. Yes properties that are of this nature, and if there are that she owns, have there been violations? Those are just two things I would think are setting a pattern if there's something to be said there. So just okay. that's all. Okay. Thank you, Mayor. I don't know if anybody has any other Thank questions at this point. We'll wait. Thank you. Are you done? Are you sure? Are you? Okay. I, I think that uh, that will be the presentation for the city of Las Vegas, Your Honor. Uh, now the, the licensee is present with council, and I'm sure they would like to address, and then at the end of that, I'd like to make a brief summation to the council. Yes, and if you'll be sure your microphones are uh, on and that you are in front speaking into the microphone. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Lee, please. Yes, Madam Mayor. Uh, if, if I may, uh, let me introduce again Ms. Hope Kwan Chung. She's a 78-year-old Nevada resident. She's been living in Nevada since 1968. I'm 69. She's become a U.S. citizen since 1976. She's been an outstanding citizen of the city of Las Vegas and the county itself. In addition to that, she purchased this property. And to answer your first question, this is the only property she owns that has any violations whatsoever. She is an outstanding citizen of not only the city of Las Vegas, but the state of Nevada. She had purchased this property in 2013 for approximately $1.2 million. Since her purchase, she's put in approximately $1 million in improvements. Each time she's been notified of any violations that has been stated by these distinguished gentlemen. Excuse me, Mr. Lee, you said she purchased this property in 2013? Correct. Okay, our records need to reflect that because I think on something you had here was that she had purchased the property in 15. So she, she had the property two She was licensed in 2015, Your Honor, but okay. the actual purchase was before that. Okay. That's correct. Thank you. So as a result of that, you've heard a litany of violations that occurred going back to try to paint the picture that this individual and this property is a hotbed for this property and only this property. However, this is a very crazy neighborhood, as you can tell. We understand you are in the process of going through development. There are other neighbors that have very similar issues. None of these, light, none of these facts are brought to light whatsoever. As to the allegations that were set forth, which are true, as to the complaints and citations, the March 2019, as rightfully indicated, once notified of any violation, she immediately cured those things, and that case was closed. Same thing with the November 2021 activity. Notification, reparations were done, case was closed. Same thing with the March uh, 2023. Now here's where it gets dicey, and this is where really the city council is really have this jurisdiction. They're trying to uh, uh, viol uh, set a penalty, enforce a penalty as a result of the chronic nuisance statute. So the history is great to know. It's great to know what happens when you're notified of a complaint and, the re and what you do to cure it. As we go to the March 2023 and the June 2023, those issues, we're not sure if we were ever notified. Matter of fact, it says that they were notified, but regardless of whether or not notification came properly or timely, those, that are, those matters were cured immediately. The latest one, which is the November 2023, the compliance audit auditor question came up. Uh, Mr. Anthony, he'll be able to go through all of the compliance issues that he's done anytime we've been notified of anything. 
So really that brings us now to the most current violation issue, which is February 13, 2024. And that had to do with a notification. Uh, there was constant inspections. Each time there's compliance corrections, fines made, she pays everything she can, she does everything she does. As to the employees staying, it is true there were three employees that stayed. They are not paying customers. They were put in there to stay, to help monitor, keep the property secure. There's been additional security hired. Anthony will go ahead and address those issues. As to the issue of the emergency suspension that occurred on March 7th, and actually let me go back. As to the February 24th, notice of noncompliance was never ever served on my client. Matter of fact, she, when she heard about the problem, went to the actual um, command center and then the appropriate sergeant handed her the notice of compliance and the violations. Thereafter, she was able to cure those things. But notice is a clear issue here. We don't believe we've received proper notice of anything. And as fact, the actual notice that was received on a notice of emergency, it's got some improper, or I'm sorry, uh, some notification dates that are incorrect. And so when you look at the totality of it, the only thing that this council is concerned of is whether or not we have in fact violated the statute of having three violations within a 30-day period, and those violations were in and within the control of the Las Vegas Municipal Code statutes. Close scrutiny needs to be taken of those statutes because they're implicating that this hope here has in fact complied, agreed, allowed, and, and participated in all of this illegal activity. I will go through each of these incidents that were talked about as to the violence that have occurred here. So before I leave that, of course, after the emergency suspension occurred, there were on-site inspections on the 13th, the 14th, 18th, and 19th, and the individuals that they saw on premises were not, were not tenants, they were workers. They were trying to cure any and all issues that they may have. Anthony will discuss and tell you all of the corrective measures that were done, all during this time after the suspension. Also, as to the um, Metro Police Department issues, it's interesting that they, Metro, is trying to implicate Miss Hope as a non-good neighbor person, that she doesn't care about her neighborhood. She clearly cares. She's put a ton of money in improvements. She's corrected every problem she's had. All she wants to do is continue being a good neighbor any time as you look at the actual stabbings that occurred, and they even indicated they might not even be tied to the Traveler's Hotel. It was actually near the premises they're on, which does allow the statute says that you have to know if it's close to your property. But for her not to enact the Good Samaritan rule and try to help somebody who's been stabbed and help take care of their things or do anything to that respect is kind of ridiculous. It's kind of going against the good neighbor policy that the city of Las Vegas has always tried to instill. The, 20, the February, I'm sorry, the June 2023 shooting, of course, that was at the entrance of the Traveler's Inn and was by a guy who was trying to get a room. And we can't control people that are trying to come through and walk through. As to the October 2023 homicide, again, this person, this homicide occurred on 3rd in Utah. It's not even close to the uh, hotel itself. As you get to the January 2024 stabbing, again, Utah and Las Vegas Boulevard. It was not within the premises of the travelers. This area is not unique. The neighbors around, you must find out whether or not the neighbors around the Todd Hotel and all these other neighbors are experiencing the same type of issues. Why we're being singled out is something that this council needs to look at. As to the February 2024 murder, of course, the suspect was arrested. There's a lot of issues about who he was and what he was there. Regardless, once we're notified of any activity, Anthony would discuss, actually, whenever a notice came out, specifically the, uh, the February, I'm sorry, the February uh, 24th, 13th notice, 
along with the March 7th notice of suspension of the things you must do to cure to try to resolve your place. Ms. Hope is just trying to operate her business. If she needs to put in additional security measures, she needs to have further compliance. You'll notice though, business license never did tell you that she completed every compliance issue. Once a notice was issued, it was completed. There's nothing outstanding right now. Anthony will tell you all the measures that they took place of it, and we'll go forward from there. Uh, with that in mind, I will go ahead and turn the mic over to Anthony. He'll go over the compliance issues of the latest March 7th letter and what we've done as respo and in response to that. Good morning. How are you doing? Good morning. I'm Thank sorry you. about the mask. It's just uh, my granddaughter at school got a cold and um, pop no, no, no. I across. just wanted to make sure that we knew who you were, and it's hard when you're covered up, so no, thank you. Not a problem. I just wanted to explain why I had it, so I, I apologize for it. I just have a, a nose running. So, um, Ms. Kwan brought me in. Um, Can you state your name for the record? Anthony bit. Owens. Ms. Kwan brought me in back in October of 2023 to do an eviction on a tenant that she had there that was uh, seen to be causing problems. Um, he provoked his rights, saying that he was there for 30 days, that he had to be evicted. So I started the eviction process, but she also brought me in, uh, she also asked me to start taking a look at how I can help more with their surrounding uh, compliance and everything. And I took a look, and those are the pictures and everything that you see now, uh, to try to see what more could be added to help secure her location. So uh, I talked to various security companies that, that we are now going to bring in to do more walk-in security around the building, um, as well as changing uh, some of the, the lighting that's in the front part of the travelers in the back part. As you also notice, there's an alley that's in the back that is shared by 1,500 business on Las Vegas Boulevard and the 1500 business that's on Casino Center. Uh, but at the end of that alley is a fence. So when people walk down there, they just seem to settle in, just congregate in the alley. So my information and everything was to light, to put more lights in the alley, to brighten it up because it is very dark and you know things are bad seem to happen in the dark. So my recommendation and in, in what I implemented for her was to add more lighting in that conti in the area, not only in the front but on the side, but also in the alley. Um, I have came in and also positioned her cameras and added more cameras so that it can catch 100% of the walkway from Las Vegas Boulevard to Utah and from Utah down to the end of the alley. So it, it covers 100% of the of the complete walkway, so there's no hiding spots. And also with the amount of lights that we're bringing in, it's going to increase the lighting. 30 to 40 percent, and in the back area, 80 percent. So there's nothing for anyone to hide. And with a 24-hour security that will be there, this this would help tremendously. Um, when I was talking to some of the officers, standing, hey, these are these are measures that need to be um, added. Um, there are plenty others that we have that I talked to Ms. Lydia in the office to change the policies. Uh, of the office, as well as to change some of the wordings so that it can better um, be uh, measured for the city uh, license department, what they wanted to see, uh, the taxes and everything added to the registration, um, as well as the check-in of the daily log sheets uh, with the address from each ID. If they don't have an ID, you can't check in. Uh, there's no laundering around the building now. These, these prices and these, these um, new settings have been set so that they can show a more uh, uh, security to the building. And I brought this, I, th I think this is probably now maybe a little bit too big, but these are banners that I'm putting around the motel to let them know it's a, it's a drug-free zone, no selling, no buying, no nothing. Um, and the back gate, I was gonna recommend, because of the gate itself all the way to the alley, as in closing off that, that alley, so that people can't go down the alley. I have uh, also talked to all the businesses in the 1500 block of uh, Las Vegas Boulevard in the 1500 block of Casino Center, and I talked to the owners and the business managers to say, hey, we need to 
try to stay together or, or to make a unified. And I think you've seen in there, there was a meeting that I tried to set up with them to let them know we need to do a, a monthly meeting so that this, these problems won't continue to happen. And they're having the same problems too. Not only just with travelers, they seem to have the same problem, loitering around uh, drug dealers trying to come in because that spot is right at the end of the um, um, uh, first Friday of the art district. And so I've been talking with the art, uh, the first Friday directors and some of the managers to try to now include that area in that to give more of a, a community setting, um, talking to different galleries to come in to do different things to to give it more of a brightness up. Um, and so these changes would definitely make um, it would would make the, the the changes that we're, we're making uh, will help with the security as well as with the people loitering around and there'll be no more drug use of people standing, uh, being able to just stand there with that. But with the security now we could just tell them to move on and there's nowhere to hide for people to, down the alley as well as around the motel. But the Tom Motel is a vacant motel. It's, it's, not, it's not operation. The Tom Motel is vacant. The fence they have there is cut so homeless people goes in and out of that uh, area. And, and I guess if you go down there today, you will see multitude of different homeless people inside of that property. Uh, I, I myself have ran them off and some of the employees talk to them, have ran people off, but they just go right inside and then when people leave, they just come right on out and hang back around the Todd because there's, there's no uh, security measures for Todd. But I talked to Ms. Kwan uh, and the other business about doing a walk around security that we will bring in the security um, that would just walk all the properties around to make sure there's no laundering from the homeless, from drug use, uh, to all type of other things that's going on in that particular area. This will help. This will help tremendously uh, to, to give it a, a more secure area so that there's no more of the, the process of what's needed. But with all the administration changes and everything that we're implementing, um, it will help tremendously so that it was not have the laundering of what uh, a lot of the officers have said that we, uh, was in the past. So. Okay. Thank you. Any questions for Mr. Collins? or Yes, please, Councilwoman Brony. Thank you, Mayor. I actually have a question for Darcy. <clears throat> Darcy, you mentioned that the city had completed an audit from January to December of 2023, but given all of the non-compliance issues prior to that, why did we only conduct an audit for one year? Are we confident that um, there are no uh, fees that we didn't recover or sort of um, fees that are owed from prior years? Uh, through you, Mayor. Um, we only did, it was a rush audit. Audits usually take a couple of months to complete. Um, the fact that the books were inadequate, it was the amount of documents that they were able to collect from Ms. Kwan. Um, our audit team was able to get this information. It probably took about two weeks to, to gather it. And so they just picked one year to just try and get some information in a matter of two weeks rather than a couple of months to complete a full audit. But no, we, we, we do know that there's gonna be additional um, fees due going further back, but we wanted to have something prepared for today. So we are in fact looking at previous years to make sure that there are no fines? Yeah, we, we um, will be working with okay. Ms. Kwan to collect those documents, but she didn't Perfect. have a lot to, to provide. Thank you. Yes, Councilwoman Diaz. Thank you, Madam Mayor. For Mr. Owens, um, these are pretty straightforward questions. So we just heard from law enforcement officials that drugs and weapons um, were seized from within the premises of the travelers. Is that correct? That I, that I didn't know. Okay. Um. Uh, also, when the SWAT team appeared on a couple of occasions, there was delayed access into the traveler's premises. Why? Anytime law enforcement shows up with a warrant to come in, why was there a delay to give access to your premises? I so if I may... No, 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 it's just, uh, Mr. Owens is the property manager, mm -hmm. yes? Well, yes, I was, I, was brought, I was brought in October. Okay. Uh, so these incidents and everything which is, was, was prior to me coming in, so they would have better understanding of that than, than I would, I'm okay. sorry. Okay. When the SWAT came at that moment, excuse me, if you security. would state your name oh, for I'm the sorry. record. My name is Lydia Vargas. I work in Intraverse Bath and Breakfast for seven years. 
thank you. And there. Oh, seven years. Okay. The the answer is when the sweat came, um, and the, our security in that moment, he don't have idea because we had so many crimes ar around there, and we don't have idea is specific in our building. So the security on he closed, and he went to notification to upstairs. So when the sweat came, he never said nothing. He broke everything. He entered and he did his job. So we never, we never uh, put, we never close for that sweat. We close because I don't know is around the, uh, the situation is around the building. And the last one I have for you all, property management team on premises is when illegal, illicit things are happening on your premises, such as a stabbing, wouldn't a call for service be done immediately from you all into law enforcement? Did you call 911 right away? Do we have a registry that you were the ones to report the incident into Metro? Yes. But that's not what I'm capturing from law enforcement. What I'm capturing from law enforcement is they arrived, well, significant time after, and then found people clearing and cleaning up the scene. To me, when something happens on my premises, I'm gonna make sure I leave it just as is so that law enforcement comes and none of the evidence is tampered or destroyed and I'm not gonna hinder an investigation. Yet, everything I'm hearing from a traveler's perspective and a management does not seem like you are cooperating with law enforcement. I'm, not, I'm sorry, that's just not right because all that time we call Metro when any dispute in our guests we call Metro. Sometimes when we call uh, 911, they transfer to Metro at 311, and we have to wait in 45 minutes, and sometimes they don't answer. So the, uh, I'm listening outside, uh, in the back, everything about the murders, about everything outside in our buildings, is because sometimes we saw what's happened, like a community, we call Metro, and when Metro came, they used our, our address. So that's why all the time when Metro came to the office, when see any problems around, we cooperate with our cameras and we open our building for her. Last year's fire department and maybe city, they recommended because so many homeless around, we put the gate. Last, we, last year we don't have gate. We put the gate and then it's, now it's, I don't know what is the excuse because we close for the BCF, our guests, but everything that crime is around our buildings. So all the time we call Metro, we try to work in with Metro, but I don't know. I would like I to know hear all, from all these gentlemen. I know all these officers because all the time I talk with him about the crime outside. Okay. So, so as a point of reference, Councilman Diaz, any time a call goes in on 911, 311, whatever, it always gets logged to the address from where the call initiated. Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean the occurrence happened at that place, but that's where the call occurred. That's why Metro has the address of travelers on each and every call. Again, it may not because it happened on our premises, but as a good neighbor, they saw something happening and they called. Let me check in with uh -huh. our hey, uh, one, more, one more thing, I'm sorry. About the murder in the cross street, yes, it was our tenant. But then he checked out and he went to the cross street to, to rent it. I don't know what his problem because every, every guest we are rented, we don't ask him what your profession. So only we, add, we rented the rooms. So when he checked out, he went to other building and cross the street, somebody shoot it in the corner. Of course, the police came to ask him to ask. We give you access to cameras, and they give you the information for all the murder. We working with the police to give you all the information about the murder. Right. Right. But he never died there. The other person, he overdosed outside. He's right. passing. He go inside to ask him for the room. Then he go downstairs, and he's, he's knocked out there. We call 911, the uh, fire department, and the este, medical came and they pick it up. He died on the, on the way, but only we tried to work with the All right. community. Th th thank you, ma'am. I want to point one thing out, and I'll have uh, the lieutenant address this. We're talking about hundreds of calls for service. 
uh, uh, over 100 to Metro, we haven't even brought Las Vegas Fire and Rescue in here, which, which have had hundreds of calls of their own. So this is not that we have, we are highlighting the most egregious incidents and what has happened. But this is a, when I call it a hotbed of criminality, it, it's not just all these, we're not getting these calls for service from all the other addresses around there. We're getting them from here. And with that, I, with the council's permission, I'd like Lieutenant Bernstein to, to take the, uh, uh, to come back to the podium and address uh, some of the points being made here, if that would be all right, Madam Thank Mayor. You. We're not quite finished with our presentation or our counter. Uh, can, can where, so. where, where the, oh. the mayor allowed me to ask a question, oh, we're comparing narratives. We will okay. let you proceed with the rest of your presentation, but we, it's important that the council be educated and aware of the two, of the just juxtaposition of the two, um, because it seems like there's a very stark uh, difference just, in yeah. narratives, and we want the truth. We yeah, want to do what is best by our community, by our neighbors, by the city, right. and so um, we, we want to hear from our law enforcement partners who help us keep everything orderly. So let them pass, please. Let them pass. Councilwoman, yes. Can you just speak to what? Yeah, can you the, reintroduce yourself so yes. we know which yes. officers respond? To yes, for the record, uh, Jesse Comer, a lieutenant with the Downtown Area Command. Thank you. So we're hearing very different narratives. Um, I'm hearing from the law enforcement side that there has been very minimal cooperation in addressing all of these ongoing chronic nuisance issues that you have been making your way to the travelers for over almost a year now, um, yet they're citing that they have been willing and able partners in addressing the criminal element. And it's, it, it's just not, it's not marrying for me. I'm not kind of hearing that. They have been, and I just wanted to hear from Metro, like what have you been through in this last year in trying to rectify, correct, get to the root of, um, I appreciate Mr. Owens wanting to now address security concerns, but I think that would have happened a year ago when most of this started, and, and they should have been saying, we need to ramp up security, we do have concerns, the adjacency is ripe. They, they would have approached us in a, almost help, help us, we don't know what to do with this situation, but my office hasn't been reached out to, I have only heard through you all in the enforcement process, so I'm just trying to parse this out and figure out from your perspective how, how willing and cooperative have the folks been at the Travelers for you guys to go in there and, and keep the community adjacency safe, because at, at the end of the day that's what you guys are trying to do. Absolutely, and I'll, I'll address a couple things along that same vein. Um, number one, we started enforcement and realizing this was an issue based upon neighbors and upon the community contacting us. Um, we look at things like police network investigations where we look at where calls um, spiking, where's violence spiking, as well as that community involvement. So the community was the first one to really bring this to our attention, and then we started to shine a light on it. We found those issues. Um, with respect to the call statistics as well, I provided the overall numbers for context for everybody on the council, but then I picked out incidents which had a direct correlation to the business. So I didn't pick somebody that got into a car accident on Las Vegas Boulevard that was in front of their property. I picked violent um, and narcotics related incidents with a direct correlation to their business. With respect to um, speaking with Ms. Kwan and her staff, uh, the community oriented policing team before I even got here was going to that property, has spoken with Ms. Kwan directly. Um, when we're talking about, you know, being here since October and the new management team, there was a homicide after that time, a month after that time. So we have made those contacts. Uh, Ms. Kwan did come to Downtown Area Command. Captain Orris, uh, who was the captain of downtown at that time, met with her directly for an extended period of time. We did serve that notice again to her because to be in good faith, we want to provide her as much information continually as we can. That's why you see a series of different um, advisories about the chronic nuisance, narcotics, and the, and the um, violent activity. So it's not a, a one-time thing where she showed up and we gave her that. It's been a continuing effort with her staff, with her directly uh, throughout this entire time. 
we can just also re-emphasize that the drugs and the weapons and everything that was in the photographs did come from rooms within the travelers. So the photograph that includes the firearms, that was a person that had been observed uh, selling narcotics at the property, was arrested, or there was an enforcement action taken. As a result of that, they got a little smarter and they realized they could drive and sell narcotics there to the customers and the people that would show up at that business and then go back to North Las Vegas. So that particular photo has evidence that was seized in North Las Vegas, but again, it correlates directly to the business at the Travelers. Okay. Thank you. Um, you may proceed with the uh, other points you want to raise. So certainly just to, re to respond to his statement, of course. Clarification is that the drugs, the, f the guns, all of that was in a residence, not on our property. So take that one out of the formula. Ms. Hope would like to at least address the council as to what she's done, what she's been to. I think it's clear also to note that the notices of non-compliance and those issues they haven't been proven. We have not been getting notices, period. Although they say it's certified, registered, we'd like to see how they were effectively done. Regardless, they're closed cases. Once we did get notice, we cured the problems. Okay. Can I give you one, only one thing? Okay, the situation that the captain will say. Excuse uh, me, Lydia. if you'd restate your name for okay, the Okay, I'm sorry, my name is Lydia Vargas. Thank okay. you. Okay, the situation he says about the person they followed in for the person, dollar, dollar dealer drugs. So that person, when they, that's right, they take it, they out two days. And when they come back in our building, we try to move to out because for that situation. We call 911, police department came in there, and we tried, we get to try to help to him to move that person but that, but the, for that situation. So the police department recommended the eviction. The eviction is, that's why in the paper they show three months, because I don't know what happened with the, with the eviction process, but that recommendation is about the police department, because that moment he cannot move that person, we're not allowed in our property. Thank so that's, that is the case they follow, okay. and they find every evidence outside okay. our buildings. Okay, and Ms. Kwang Chung, if you'll state your name for the record and make your comment, please. My name is Hope Kwang Chung. Okay. I'm born 1946, August 15. I moved to Las Vegas 1969. I became a citizen 1976 in Las Vegas. I start working, first job is a Union Plaza opening night. I'm very proud of it, American citizen. I'm very proud of it. I'm in Las Vegas. I work in, uh, and I campaign for the mayor. I try to, I tell, when I, I, I worked at uh, Aladdin Hotel over 20 years. When I am, I am F came, I opened the restaurant, so we had a three partner. I sold my restaurant 1.2 million, and I put it in over a million dollars uh, to remodel. I didn't even know they don't have a bathroom until I got in there. But we have a ladies' bathroom, men's bathroom, three of them, three each, and I, we matter top to bottom. Tried everything that I know how to do it. I did. I just started, and then I had a two customer, one customer, and I didn't have a no problem building up. And until COVID come, and the COVID come, we didn't have no customer. So I told Lydia, Lydia, lower the price. Tell the customer it's a seventy dollars, sixty five dollar. It include the tax. I will pay tax. Just, you know, that's all included. So we got $70, $65. I didn't know that I'm breaking the rule that I have to set, you know, how much it is. Before the COVID, it, it is that they all gave me a, 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 the, the computer. So I didn't have to worry about tax. But when the COVID come, we only got $70 in a room. Two people. So then I send the CPA, is it include the tax? 
So and it, they give me tax, so I paid it. And also the license. I didn't know, I applied the license a few years ago in, with Lydia. I didn't know that I have to change it. We pay everything I hate, I always pay ahead. Mm -hmm. And then we know, nobody tell me that I have to do changing it. Nobody told me. And then so I thought it was okay to uh, let them stay. And then suddenly, and then uh, because mom, my mom, I had a mom and dad in my house. Mom died in 98. And uh, so I was staying in hospital 18 hours, 16 hours a day, but I still work in the daytime in an, every day, seven days a week I work. I don't wanna, when I hide the girl, I tell them, don't break the room, don't lie. And that is the only thing and I ask, don't break the room. And then under the drugs, I don't smoke, I don't drink in whole my life. I didn't know what is a drug, only I know marijuana smell. So we told him, she know that one day the, they got arrested. I cleaned the room, I cleaned the room, I do my laundry in a Korean way. I don't, I send that out, when they come back, they have all kinky hair, all so dirty. So I did it myself. And then I saw in the air condition, I saw this much truck. And I call her up, call 911, I don't want this, this one touch it. And they say, oh, you can make a lot of money. I said, I don't want to make a lot of money. Call the 911. So I called the 911. I told them, I don't want to, I'm scared. I don't want to touch the drug. They say, the drugs, please come. So I give them all the drugs. They went that room, they took the police, took that drugs. I tried everything. I called them. In a few years ago, they, when I called 311, they come fast, they're helping me. They call me anytime you need. So I told them, I think that the people, room 13, they are selling the drug. And then officer told me that nothing we can do unless they make it, they commit a crime. I said, then what do you want me to do? And then they say, if you need it again, call me. That was what they said. And then when we have a so that, I, I thought I didn't know that it, I break the rule to call the 911 before only 311. And then they have a lot of problem over there. Before the uh, uh, downtown redevelopment, we didn't have that much homeless. Now we're doing everything come. And then they all standing there. I called so many times. They, they, uh, they uh, graffiti in my restaurant. I put $300,000 in a restaurant. And then as soon as I go home, all graffiti come, all the building. I call the police, nothing they can do. I pay over 10 more time to graffiti all the time. I don't wanna, I'm very proud of it. I wanna, Las Vegas is beautiful as it is. I don't wanna make any problem. What I didn't make mistake, I'm sorry. And then I didn't know what the reasons mean. When I called it the problem, the, I told them, don't talk bad word. And because if you don't respect it, they will not respect. So they, they open the mouth, they say mother, me, all that. So, you know, they were just threatening me. So I called the 911 and then they say, he have a gun? I say, no. And then they transfer 311. I, we hold the phone 40 minutes. I said, I cannot handle this. So I drive myself to police station. That's I met the Captain Ollie. And then and he told, he gave me a paper, loosens. I said, what is the loosens? And then he said, if you follow up, I will help you. That was a February. And then I did it, everything I know how to do it. And then the, the, the tax people came. And then you cannot do that. I say, I thought it was, you know, this, I never, I even ask one dollar from Corby. And I tried to do myself for city. And then I told Anthony, when I sell this, I'm gonna donate the money to police station. They are helping me a lot. And then they told me that, so that's how I got a $70, $65 for the room with the tax. And they say, no, you break the rule. I say, I didn't know. So th now they tell me, you have to separate. So we've been doing, the, we, they asked me, Lydia, 
tried to separate everything. And then the license department, they came every year. They didn't tell me where to break the rule. And she, she, they teach her because I go to Korea. I mean, uh, taking care of her mom. And then every time I, I come, they came when most time I'm not in America. And she told me, everything OK, Miss Hope. They came. I did everything. So I didn't know anything breaking law until February. When the February, the Captain only promised me, going to help me. I said, OK, I will follow you, whatever you say. So they came every week, and I changed it. I changed the uh, registration. I changed the book. I changed the everything. And so they told me, you're OK now. And then uh, uh, the building department came, and then they gave me notice to fix this, you know, a few things. It is a uh, Home Depot. So we did it in one week. We fixed everything we need. They say, it look good. And the health department say, we are the cleanest one in the whole area. So I thought I was doing so good. So I went to LA in a funeral. And then Thursday before the funeral start, they say, they shut me down. And I asked the captain. And the, OK, the, Ms. Hope. Yes. Ms. Hope Kwan. Yes. Um, I look at the area. I've lived here since 1964. So your efforts, what this needs is we have issues here in the community. The entire country has issues. We realize what these issues are. Whoever is your business manager or your manager, ignorance of the law is not appropriate that you didn't know. As an owner, as a parent, as a child, as a business person, it is hard, but you have to find out what are the laws. Now, here in the city of Las Vegas, we try so hard to communicate and give businesses and owners guidance so what I'm hearing from you is that you, uh, your story is very compelling. We do have a drug problem here. We do have issues of having the backing and funding for enough law enforcement yeah. to be able to do their jobs. Let me finish this, if I may. I would like to rise above the issue at this point before us because it can go on and on. I would like to ask both our legal team and Darcy and Metro, can, this is a drug issue in this whole area. We do have homeless issues. We don't have the laws behind us. Can we, and Mr. Owen, or is it Mr. Collins? Mr. Owens. Oh, and, Mr. And Owens. Yes. Everything you've talked about is reasonable. And knowing that Lydia has been working at this site for seven years, there has to be a way to clean up what can we do, how can we get a plan to help clean up I know lighting makes a difference. I know our city manager has been involved in this for years, trying to bring light to different areas where we have pockets in the naked city, everywhere you know you go. How do we make a plan for good people but not fully knowledgeable about what they're supposed to be doing? And because it's in Ward 3. We need to fix the mess, not punish an entity that if, in fact, there's a plan that's crisp, clear, and you will do this and you will do that, and if you can't do it, that creates another problem. We have the drug issue. We have the homeless issues. We do have people that can walk into any neighborhood and overdose or commit a crime. We're not fenced in our neighborhood. So is it possible, not necessarily opening it at this time, but in a reasonable time frame to create a safe environment that will 
help the entire neighborhood, uh, which is what we're trying to do in every single ward, is make sure they're safe in compliant and doing good business. This is about doing business, cleaning up, and coming up with something that will work. Well, Mayor, is again, it possible? I apologize, Mayor. Uh, for the record, again, Jesse Colmer, Senior Lieutenant with the Downtown Area Command. Uh, just to give a little history as well within that area, we have um, put a lot of effort into that area, specifically my community-oriented policing sergeant's here for that specific reason. He has directed his team along with city crews to help with cleanups and things of that nature. Directly adjacent to that property to the north, there is a lot that used to be the, uh, the Thai barbecue restaurant. That particular lot was an issue. Again, there was narcotic sales occurring at the Travelers, which was causing more people to uh, congregate in that area. We worked with uh, code enforcement. We got that fence because the owner was not willing to do so through the city. They were able to do that, and that has cleaned up. The Todd Motor Motel, the one directly to the south, I actually spoke with the um, new owners of that property because they own properties within Naked City, um, and that's within our, spe our uh, area that we focus very heavily on, our Safe Village Initiative. They're actually the ones that told me that Hope was in town trying to sell the property. We had made uh, many different times where we had tried to contact her and we would get phone calls at 1.30 in the morning indicating that she was out of the country and so there was some difficulty with that but we had also had in-person contact. So I just wanted to discuss that, that we have not written off this area and we never will. Um, Councilwoman Diaz and I, along with a different coalition of people, worked with businesses uh, along that route up to Charleston and back. We are going to continue to work on that area through our community or policing folks. When they see stuff, we have um, SEPTED or the person that goes out and looks and sees where lighting is important, um, things of those nature, so that we can improve that. We have continued to push forward within that area and any area in downtown area command that we find uh, a higher crime rate or an issue with homeless, things of that nature. So we have and we will continue to do so. The reason that we're here today is because we were able to work on that property directly north right, by putting a fence up and stopping that. We are able to work on the property across the street next to Boston Pizza and the tattoo shop as I have spoken with those owners. We are able to slow down the homeless problems within those areas. Um, we have a homeless outreach team. The city has a more team. We have engaged all of those resources as well as you know, making them aware of the homeless courtyard, being providing transportation if necessary. So we have taken a, a full approach to that. Um, and we will continue to do so. The problem was we came up against this one particular issue that was stopping our ability to make an impact in that area, and that's why we're here before you today. And, and from your perspective, though, on this particular and realizing all of that, because mm -hmm. I know and Sheriff McMahill and sharing it and knowing the wonderful work you're doing, but there's just, you can't be everywhere all the time. Is there a plan that could be put in place with specifics in order for them and this location to be exemplary, get it stabilized, get it open if you do this, 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 this? Madam Mayor, if I yeah. could, I, I think that the only voice that we haven't heard from so far is about the residents and the adjacency. and. Um, I've had sit-down conversations with many constituents and residents who, when they learned about the shutdown, were very, very relieved. And they are obviously not here because they fear retaliation if they were to come before us to articulate um, how the shutdown of the travelers has improved their living um, quality of life in the adjacency. Right. And so I wanted to, with a moment of privilege, share um, some of these concerns and some of these community perspective Sorry. about what we're entertaining because I think that that's been the missing last final piece here and I've sat down with them I've heard from them and everyone is saying we're on the right path um, here with okay. entertaining uh, this and potentially permanently um, closing this location, but I want to first by start um, urgent concern regarding Travelers BNB. Dear Councilwoman Diaz, I hope this letter finds you well. I'm writing to you as a concerned resident of downtown Las Vegas regarding a pressing issue that is significantly impacting our community, the presence of Travelers BNB in our neighborhood. While I understand the importance of fostering tourism and supporting local businesses, it has become increasingly evident that Travelers BNB is detrimental to the 
the safety and well-being of our downtown area. Specifically, numerous reports and observations indicate that Travelers BNB is failing to uphold the standards expected of hospitality establishments and actively contributing to the proliferation of illegal activities within our neighborhood. One of the most alarming issues that has arisen in the apparent involvement of Travelers BNB in the distribution of illegal drugs. It has come to our attention through various sources, including concerned residents and law enforcement agencies, that the establishment has become a hotspot for drug trafficking. The presence of drug dealers and the sale of narcotics on the premises of Travelers BNB not only perpetuates addiction, but also invites an influx of individuals struggling with substance abuse into our community. I have previously written your office regarding the homelessness and drug problems in your district, illegal fires, making of drugs, and prostitution. This influx of drug activity has brought about a noticeable increase in crime rates in the vicinity of Travelers BNB. Residents have reported incidents of theft, vandalism, and other criminal activities occurring in the area which are directly linked to the presence of individuals associated with the establishment. As a result, many residents, including myself, feel unsafe and apprehensive about the future of our neighborhood. Furthermore, the negative impact of Travelers BNB extends beyond the immediate vicinity of the establishment. The reputation of downtown Las Vegas is, as a vibrant and welcoming destination for visitors and residents alike is being tarnished by the association with illicit activities and crime. This affects the quality of life for those of us who call this area home and undermines efforts to promote economic growth and community development in our neighborhood. The Travelers BNB is kitty corner from the largest parking lot in the Arts District. People from all over the valley park there for special events such as First Friday and allowing travelers to stay open will hurt residents in the immediate area and residents from all over Las Vegas, making the issue not a downtown Las Vegas issue, but a greater Las Vegas issue. As a community resident, I urge you to take swift and decisive action to address this issue. Steps must be taken to hold Travelers BNB accountable for their actions and ensure that they stay permanently closed. This may involve conducting a thorough investigation into the allegations of illegal activity, revoking licenses or permits if necessary, and implementing stricter oversight measures um, to prevent similar issues. Um, and it goes on. But I also want to state another resident's um, written testimony that went, came by my office. Councilwoman Olivia Diaz, I'm writing to you about the Travelers BNB recently shut down as I am hoping it will stay that way. I live next to the building in an adjacent apartment complex. A narrow alley separates us. For as long as I have lived at my apartment since 2016, the Travelers BNB has consistently been the main drug dealing street prostitute and stolen contraband hub for all the downtown main street and arts district area. As an interested community advocate, I am aware of how the Travelers BNB ownership turns a blind eye to the drug dealers, prostitutes, and thieves renting rooms, how rent is bartered for building upkeep, and also how people needing a place to live are charged their entire monthly governmental checks to stay there. I've had several encounters with the owner through the years concerning the harboring of active criminals and how she enables their activities. She has an uncanny and insidious talent for dishing out delusional intent and reality. A couple of weeks ago, a man was raped by another man in the abandoned Todd Motel next door that houses, that houses those who do gnarly business at the Travelers but cannot pay the rent. All the nefarious activity spills over into the apartments where I live, where older people, children, and women live daily in frustration and fear and having to smell the stench that emits from the alley because of the Travelers BNB. The place keeps the property values in the neighborhood down as it gets worse. Visitors in the new city parking lot across the street are catching on to revive the area's old reputation with warnings to stay away. There have been shootings on Main Street from people originating at the Travelers. I have personally witnessed two since 2020. For trouble from Charleston Boulevard to Sahara Avenue and West Disson City behind the Strat, the Travelers BNB has played as home base. I've been present on two occasions outside the property when police tanks with SWAT teams smoke bombed the building in raids. One day a few months ago, I was taking my trash out when I had to duck away fast as a police sniper was set up in broad daylight in the alley across the street pointing a rifle. So I'm just going to stop right here. But obviously, the adjacent neighbors are fearful. And they feel relief that this activity has kind of come to a close, has been put to an end, 
And while I'm not unsympathetic that some folks may have been displaced, I have to look at what you were legally permitted to do in your establishment. Your establishment was never licensed to be more than a hostel or hotel for up to a seven day stay, yet we found people who had been there longer than seven days. Mm -hmm. One minute, my, my turn now to kind of get some things on the record. Also, I, I dispute the fact that you're trying to say that she didn't know about these notices to correct because I have notice of corrections here from the City of Department Business Licensing Division that date back to June 13th, 2023, and it's the same exact issues that were cited that needed to be corrected. And so we have um, failure to maintain adequate room records, journal registration of uh, cards, receipt registers, failure to provide, keep and maintain an adequate public register. Everything was inaccurate, violations were noted. We, we left that behind. I do have um, Ms. Lidia's signature on here that she was in receipt of this. Then we went back on November 15th of 2023. Same exact issues we cited in June are being recited back in November. So we gave you five months to work through establishing cleaner, straighter processes, kind of get the house in order. Still, same things are being cited here. Um, this time, it just, we put that we emailed Ms. Kwan about it. I don't think anybody wanted to physically sign it. Um, then on just February 14th, 2024, same exact deficiencies, same exact deficiencies are being cited. And um, number of rental units were up and then the length of stay were in violation of your business license. So I can't in good conscience say, she didn't know, and you have a business license, you have to uphold it to the letter of the law, and that's just because of everything that I have um, read into the record, that I've heard from the adjacency. I got a text message from someone who's also a small business owner in the neighborhood, also saying that he personally has over 100 videos that he has taken of all of this happening. I just can't in good conscience turn a blind eye and say, we can rectify this. Well, and I think, too, the fact is she has admitted the fact that she didn't know that's not an answer you have to. So why don't we go ahead and move this? I think so, Madam Mayor. Enough, unless there's any other comment, see. question from council here, I think we've heard I'm that. going to um, follow our staff and our law enforcement's um, plea are, are to... You, are you closing this hearing and making a motion without hearing the rest of ours? I thought you were going to give us a chance to respond. You're ready to make Wait, I thought Ms. Kwan was the last bit no, of your you testimony. No, us to allow him to do that, and then she had the right to speak. We at least have to have a closing argument. Mr. Curtis would like to Mr. address. Mr. Curtis, what do you opine? I would like to address. Uh, well, I'm, I'm, we're, I want to make sure they have a full and fair hearing, of course. Okay. Uh, and uh, yes, I think we should give, I will give a really brief argument. Do you, do you wish to put forth any more factual statements yes. from anyone other, you know, you and I can argue, uh, sir, yeah. but, but as far as facts you wish to put before the, uh, the council, I think we should leave it open to do that. We don't need a, res a re resuscitation of, of, of old arguments here. Correct. And, and let, but if there's something so new that can I be offered. I think that's very wise, Mr. Curtis. Yeah. Let's go ahead. Is Metro that certainly that has made their statements back and appreciate it. So let's have a closing comment from you with the extra information you might add, please. So, Mr. Curtis, would you want to close first, or do you uh, want me to? Uh, well, I have the burden, so uh, I should go last. Okay. okay. Very good. <laughs> Um, Madam Mayor, uh, we actually echo your sentiments. We believe you are absolutely correct that unless you have active involvement from all the neighborhoods to help cure this problem, all you're doing is furthering the problem. If you follow Councilman Diaz's recommendation that she's leaning towards, and that is to shut this place down, now you have an additional closed building. Next door to one Todd Motel that is already closed, next to a bunch of abandoned other buildings that are shuttered up and fenced, it is not a good look for the city of Las Vegas. What you really need is proactive neighbors and people like Mrs. Kwan who is willing to finance whatever is necessary to make this push. It is not going away. This problem is just not going to shutter the building, 
And you're now then going to make her a considerable expense to secure the building and keep the same riffraff out that we're talking about right now, but with nobody there. So for us to just go ahead and follow through and say that, no, you've had chronic nuisances, you as a council have to follow the statute of the code that says that we had in fact violated three times within 30 days with not just conjecture, with not just so, uh, uh, explanations of what happened with responses 9-11, but actual things that tied this owner to those incidents which would violate the code and require a suspension or penalty. This, of course, is before the city council. Before you, we have the right, obviously, we have the right to go ahead and file litigation and go up to district court to, to contest the March 7th notice that you gave us. We didn't. We decided we'll go ahead and hear it before the council first. But be assured, we're not just gonna sit back and let this thing disclose now without, just because you, you think it's the best thing to do. If we violated the law, let a court tell us we violated the law. We agree, you are correct, Madam Mayor, that in conjunction with our business license, our Las Vegas Metro Police Department, the neighborhood around, you can be an example. Typically, you have uh, owners that are not willing, not responsive, not willing to help, not willing to share their burden to cure this problem. You have one here. She's willing to do whatever you tell her to do. And once we get notice of compliance, we will go ahead and comply. I think business license will tell you, every time that they cited her for a business license violation, she came and cured it. So now we're going to the severe March 7th based on the this three incidents within a 30-day period, which I think you need to know and look through those actual incidents to make sure you support your motion. Now, with that in mind, I pass it to Mr. Curtis. Thank you. Thank you. I, I think we, it's important here to uh, keep our eye on the ball in terms of what we're here to do. Uh, we're not going to solve the drug and homeless pop problem with, with uh, this issue here today. And uh, with all due respect, I, I think the licensee sort of misses the point of what we're doing here today. I mean, she's saying things like, I'm scared, I can't handle this. It's obvious to me, and I think to many people in this chamber, that the licensee is probably beyond her capabilities to properly run a business like this in this area. But be that as it may, we're only here to decide one thing, whether the operation of this building of this business, the licensee, as a hotel, limited stay hotel, and hostelry, those two licenses, and whether there is substantial evidence that they are not being run in that way, and whether the continued criminal activity and illegal and unlawful activity in the area is, as encouraged by this licensee, has, constitutes a public nuisance. And this Council is here to determine whether the operation of this business constitutes a public nuisance due to the facts which have been presented to the council today and whether there is substantial enough evidence to find that it's a, a public nuisance exists because or in direct relation to this licensee. And if that is the case, then the council has a variety of options before it, one of which is revocation. And I think, given what Councilwoman Diaz has said, what Metro has testified to, just the litany of illegal and unlawful and nefarious activities, which are happening, again, right on Las Vegas Boulevard, right at the cusp of the Las Vegas Arts District, with shootings, stabbings, overdoses, and drug dealings going on all the time. This more than constitutes a public nuisance which, under the circumstances, the only way to eradicate it is to shut the business down. No, and, that, sir. and that is our, re our recommendation, that uh, staff's recommendation and Metro's recommendation is that the council vote for a revocation of this business license because I think it has been shown with substantial evidence that this licensee is incapable of running this business yes, in I an am. awful way. Yes, I am. Wait, wait, wait. I will wait, fight. Please, please. Mayor, please. please one. No. no, I'm sorry. It's at, at a time. I'm sorry. We can't have. So, Madam Mayor, I'm going to follow our legal attorney, John Curtis's advice. Um, the confidential business licensing uh, metro reports, the evidence is overwhelming um, for the past year of things that 
shouldn't be happening at any business establishments and um, you know, even the $8,800 um, in back owed taxes, penalties, interests uh, for underreporting is problematic for me. Um, so with all of these reasons, I'm going to move to um, permanently revoke the business license. I, we Jeff Dorkak, City Attorney, that would be both licenses involved, as Mr. Curtis laid out at the beginning, hotel license and residence hostel single room license. For both licenses, yes, correct. And Mr. Curtis, um, down the road in a year or two, <laughs> is this a permanent in perpetuity revocation or is there an opportunity in the future for under certain plan and all the things I inferred. It's a permanent revocation of this license and this operation. She can, after a time certain, uh, reapply for a business license with the with the city. I think a year she has one year later she can apply apply for another business license. But it would be in effect for this owner at this business at this time a revocation of their ability to operate this business as it is it exists now but would not foreclose it being operated in the future as such a business, but this licensee could not come before the council for another year. For a year, okay. Um, I have to assure you that the issues with which you're dealing in this are issues of the neighborhood. We've heard that time and again, but we've also heard from other business people and residents very clearly that this is a step well and I'm sure we have others who would speak the other way but at this point because we are all working together this is this revocation of these two licenses for one year which is no we'll talk later please you can call the mayor's office and we can chat but there has been a motion and it has been posted and um, both of those licenses have been revoked. Thank, Thank you. Thank you for coming down. Thank you. Thank you, also gentlemen. And law enforcement forever. We all are indebted to you for everything you do every day, all day long. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we now move on to Uh, we're at 40, okay, 42. I couldn't get it, it was stuck. Recommending committee bills eligible for adoption at this meeting, bill number 2024-8. Uh, Councilman Knudsen, would you like the bills read? Yes, ma'am. Bill number 2024-8, an ordinance to repeal and replace LVMC section 19.10.20 pertaining to the CV Civic Zoning District to provide updated standards and procedures for that district and to provide further related matters. And uh, would you please move on that? Madam Mayor, move to approve. There's a motion to approve agenda item 42, please vote. And then please post. That motion carries. We'll move on to agenda item 43, recommending committee bills eligible for adoption later meeting. Item number 43, bill number 223-28 will be heard at a later meeting. And uh, item 44 on the consent agenda is considered to be routine, is recommended for approval by the Department of Community Development. Mayor Pro Tem, may I have a motion to approve this consent agenda, please? Move to approve the consent agenda. Thank you. Please vote on the motion and please post. Okay, and that motion carries. We'll move on to items. Is that right? Oops. 45. Yes. Uh, item number 45 through 48 appear on the one motion, one vote agenda. However, I understand Councilwoman Diaz, you'd like to pull off item 48 for discussion. We'll hear that item individually after the reigning <laughs> items are considered. 
These are items 45 through 47, may be considered one motion, one vote, as they are routine items with no condition. Changes, any person representing an application or a member of the public or a member of the council not in agreement with the condition, all standard conditions for the applications recommended by staff should request to have that item removed from this portion of the agenda. 45, 230565 SUP 1, applicant Ephraim Zakin owner, Vintage Vegas Gambling Inc. on a land use entitlement project request for proposed 5,721 square foot automobile rental use at 128 Fremont Street, C2, General Commercial Zone, Ward 5 with Councilman Creer. Number 46, 230624, applicant new singular wire Wireless PCS LLC owner of the Louise Ann Benda Living Trust on the f land following land use entitlement project request 0.97 acres at 7941 North Jones Boulevard RE residence state zone six with Councilwoman Bruni number 46A 230624 VR1 to allow a 13 foot residential adjacency setback where 270 feet is the minimum required. 46B 230624 SUP 1, major amendment to approve special use permit SUP 60674 for the proposed expansion of an existing wireless communication facility, stealth design use. Number 4723 SDR1, applicant Peterson Management Owner, Madison Church LLC. Land use entitlement project request proposed five story tall 92 unit mixed use development with 7,520 square feet. Commercial area with waivers of Appendix F interim downtown Las Vegas area two development standards on 0 0.80 acres, 300 South 7th Street C1, limited commercial zone ward three. Planning Commission and staff recommend approval of all items. These are public hearings which I declare open. Is anyone wishing to be heard on these items? Please come forward. And Madam Seeing, Mayor, we're going to yes. hold forward items 47 and 48. You want to? Yes. yes I, oh, I would one. like 47 just so we can, the council can kind of see the project and the scope and know what's coming in terms of development in okay. our downtown. Okay. So this will be these items for the approval on the one motion, one vote will be 45, 46, 46A, 46B. So on those issues, anyone wishing to make comment? I'll close the public hearing and uh, Mayor Pro Tem may have a motion for one vote on 45, 46, 46A and B, please. Move to approve. Thank you. There's motion to approve. Please vote and please post. Okay, and now I just read 47, so let's read 48. Separate. Separately. So do you want to make comment on 47 first? Just if Ms. Lazovich can come and present agenda item 47 so that the council knows the project and then we'll go to 48. Okay, well I'll read this does look. It's the same thing. It's exactly the same. Okay. Okay. Yes, please. Okay, my apologies. Jennifer Lazovich, 1980 Festival Plaza Drive, here today on behalf of the applicant. If you could look at the overhead for a moment, please. Is it on yours? Oh, okay, it's not on mine, so I didn't know. Uh, so this is where the site is located, it is on 7th and Bridger. Uh, right now there is a church that sits there. They have uh, approached our client to move quite some time ago. In fact, our client also assists them by helping them uh, with their architecture for their new site that they're moving to. And so with that, um, what the buildings are on the site will go away and instead will be a mixed use project. There will be ground floor commercial of approximately 7,500 square feet. And then above that will be 92 residential units. Uh, we are also providing parking, um, approximately 126 spaces uh, of parking will be provided. Again, that's with 92 okay. units of residential and 7,500 square feet of commercial. 
We do appreciate staff recommending approval of this project, the Planning Commission, and you know I, we appreciate Councilwoman Diaz uh, pulling this item off the consent agenda just so that we can highlight you know an exciting project that's coming downtown. Thank you. Okay, now do you want to move on this one separately? Yes, if there are no questions from my colleagues, um, I just wanted to s show folks that we're trying to be as prudent as possible with mixed use development and making sure that um, we, we know land is scarce and we need to start building upward and creating more awesome living spaces. And I'm hopeful that maybe some of our teachers that li um, work at the Strong Start Academy or work at the LVA will be within walking distance of where they work. And, and let me at this point then reopen the public hearing, which I've closed, but also let me go to planning and see if there's any input here. Thank you, Mayor Seth Floyd, for the record. Approval. <laughs> we don't get that very often. I, I, I just wanted to open with that since the mayor out, you know, <laughs> likes to, to, to keep a tally. Um, you said confetti. It's very short, Mayor. Uh, while waivers are requested regarding setbacks, parking, and landscaping, staff finds the proposed infill mixed use development adheres to the overall intent of the Vision 2045 <laughs> Downtown Las Vegas Master Plan. The project is designed in a compatible manner with the existing development in the surrounding area, and therefore, staff recommends approval. Bravo, bravo. Um, anyone from the public? Okay, let me close public hearing on this. Now, go ahead, please make your motion. Thank you for indulging me, Ms. Lazovich. Um, and with that, I'm going to move to approve agenda item 47. Okay, and please vote and please post. And if you're not getting to, there it is. Uh, carries, thank you very much. We'll thank move you. on to 48. Uh, 230664 SDR1 public hearing, applicant owner, City of Las Vegas, possible action, land use entitlement project request, major amendment to an approved site development plan review SDR47296 for a proposed two story tall 9,500 square foot addition to an existing 24,245 square foot charter primary school development with waivers of the Appendix F in the room downtown Las Vegas area two development standards on 1.56 acres at 320 South 9th C2 general commercial zone also in Ward 3 with Councilwoman Diaz and, and uh, Planning Commission and staff recommend approval I'm really having difficulty here and it is a public hearing which I declare open so good morning yes <laughs> good morning good morning madam mayor and council members Rosa Cortez, City Engineer, Deputy Director of Public Works. And morning, Sean Robinson, Assistant City Traffic Engineer. Hey, Sean. Thank you for having us this morning. We're gonna present the project. First, I'd like to just show the existing site conditions. What you have in front of you at the top are photos of the existing pasture house. This is a view on your screen on the left-hand side, looking from Las Vegas Academy. Looking east, that is the building that will be demolished and where the new building will be constructed. The picture to the right of that is looking from uh, Las Vegas Academy again toward the north, and then the other picture is looking to the west where the parking lot exists today, and then the bottom photos are just overall aerial views of where the project is located, which is on the um, southwest corner of Bridger and 9th Street. Here is our site plan layout. The construction will occur south of the existing school property. And I will uh, do a closer view of that. And what we're proposing to do here is add a new 9,500 square foot building to accommodate third, fourth, and fifth grade, which will be uh, three additional classrooms per grade. We are also expanding the playground area with uh, a new shade structure as well. We're gonna be restriping the parking lot. And we're adding new fencing that will match the existing ornamental fencing that exists on the campus today. 
and we will be incorporating some offsite improvements along 9th Street, and Sean will be discussing that here in the next slide. Before I pass it over to Sean, I just want to show you some renderings of the proposed building. These are views from the east, uh, north, and west side of the building. And as you can see, it's very compatible to the existing area and to the existing school that's there today. So with that. And Ms. Cortez, these buildings were vetted through the Historic Preservation Commission? Correct. We actually um, or the buildings. I don't know why I'm saying these buildings, yeah, but it's one. <laughs> yeah. So we did present to the Historic Preservation Commission as a courtesy because this actual parcel is not on the National Register, but we are located between two um, areas that are, and so we did make a presentation letting them know what we were proposing to do. And the feedback was from them very positive. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great, and again, for the record, Sean Robinson, Assistant City Traffic Engineer. Um, so um, today, in working closely with Councilwoman Diaz's office, we understand that there may have been some concerns related to traffic in this proposed project. And so in an effort to mitigate possible operation issues, Public Works has acknowledged these concerns and has provided some additional conditions of approval. Uh, first, we'd like to recommend making, and that's what this exhibit shows here, making 9th Street from Bridger Avenue to Lewis Avenue and Lewis Avenue from 9th Street to 10th Street a one-way street. And, the, and second, we would like to recommend once the school is reopened that the operators of the school contact the Transportation Engineering Division within 60 days to conduct an on-site review and evaluation of the school operations for both drop-off and pickup. So in working with Councilwoman's office, um, Public Works has gone out to the school during morning and afternoon to observe the current operations. Staff observed that the current operations and parking for the area did not seem problematic. However, it is fully recognized that the expansion will generate more traffic in the area, and in order to mitigate, staff recommends the change of the one-way street adjacent to the school. The change of the one-way street will provide additional drop-off area adjacent to the school along 9th Street as well as reduce congestion and increase capacity by eliminating the friction between the opposing directions of traffic as it exists today. So this change would require additional signage and pavement markings as necessary to make this a one-way street. Uh, the one-way street also removes the potential U-turns within school zones, which is always an issue adjacent to schools, and all of this which allows, as a result, for improved efficiencies for operations of the school and drop-off area. The change of the one-way street would also need to be approved at the City of Las Vegas Traffic and Parking Commission before proceeding. It is anticipated that the on-street parking will be shared between the residents and the school, all is done as is done with other areas in the downtown. During staff's recent observations, there did not appear to be any lack of on-street parking within the area. This could be attributed with the morning and afternoon programs such as Safe Key which can reduce the intensity of the pickup and drop off times. Additionally, the parking needs uh, for the school start time and release with respect to the adjacent neighborhoods morning and evening commutes should be different enough to provide enough shared parking between the needs of the school and the adjacent neighbors. The preliminary layout that's before you shows that the number of on-street parking will remain mostly unchanged, resulting in an addition of one more on-street parking stall. However, even though with these mitigations, Public Works still recommends, as general with other schools that are opening, um, that the operator conduct an on-site review and Public Works evaluate the school operations uh, within 60 days of reopening. And is it your, and is it current, and I see Dr. Malich out there, that as the pickup or drop-off comes, that they come whichever direction, obviously north to south, through the parking lot, and that's a loop. No, not through the parking. It doesn't, um, because the congestion coming out that one spot there and having built a school and knowing the traffic issues one has with 360 children coming out. If you'd announce yourself and then, thank you. Dr. Tammy Malich, director. Nope, you're not on. 
Dr. Tammy Malich, Director of Youth Development and Social Initiatives for the record. Madam Mayor, um, the drop-off pickup that was approved by the Charter Authority and has been reviewed by our Traffic Engineer Office is in front of the school and staff is out there facilitating so parents don't even have to turn their car off. They pluck those little babies right out of the car and walk them up the walkway through the gate. Okay, well just the thought from experience of 26 years we ended up using the lower school parking just to keep the traffic moving because to stop one car there you can load four or five at a time if you use that south end of the building. So just for the future, I've lived it, done it, best to learn from experience. So thank you, thank but you. the charter school board did approve it the way you've said. Yes, ma'am. So then we're clean. Perfect. Thank you. Um, and uh, does planning have anything to do with any of this? No. <laughs> yes, Madam Mayor. <laughs> and? Peter Lowenstein for the record. <laughs> so um, while their waivers are requested for this project, the proposed school expansion adheres to the overall intent of the 2045 downtown master plan, and we are recommending approval, but um, at the motion, we do have two added public works conditions. Mr. Anderson uh, can read into the record now so that when it, if a motion comes, they'll be part of the record. Okay, let's do that, please. And as alluded uh, by the Assistant City Traffic Engineer, um, here are the conditions to be added. Um, please add a condition that says the developer of this site shall submit an appropriate request to the City of Las Vegas to convert 9th Street from Bridger Avenue to Lewis Avenue and Lewis Avenue from 9th Street to 10th Street to one way southbound and eastbound prior to the issuance of permits for on-site development. If this request is approved by the City Traffic Engineer, the developer shall be responsible for all costs associated with this conversion, including slurry, signage, and markings, and such improvements shall be constructed concurrent with on-site development activities. And the second condition to be added, the operators of the school shall contact the Transportation Engineering Division, Rick Schroeder, at 702-229-2452 uh, or rschroeder at lasvegasnevada.gov within 60 days of the reopening of the school to schedule an on-site review and evaluation of the school operations for both drop-off and pickup. Comply with the recommendations of the transportation engineering representative resulting from this evaluation. Thank you. So I know that we agree with ourselves on this, I'm sure. Yes, And Dr. Mallet, you, yes. <laughs> Okay, uh, this is a uh, public hearing item, so does anybody have any comments they would like to add or make while we catch more confetti? Okay, I'm going to close the public hearing, and any comments, questions from council? We're good? Thank We're you, Madam Mayor. So. If we could have the previous slide showing um, where we see the traffic flow patterns. I just think um, our awesome public works and um, Department of uh, Traffic uh, and safety for um, helping me because I know that previously I was a stickler with CCSD about traffic flow patterns uh, for a new build and uh, listening to my constituents on that item we had to work through some things on the front end and this was no different even though it's our strong start charter school I want to make sure the residents as you can see across from that strong start Academy there were some concerns from the residents in the adjacency and I told our team we got to also stay in front of it. We need to make sure that we're working in, you know, these changes now so that when the school opens uh, bigger and better that we are ahead and hopefully mitigating all of the traffic safety issues that we wouldn't have caught sight of maybe until um, we, we reopen. So I'm really, really thankful to everyone. And with that, I'm going to move to approve agenda item 48 um, with the uh, red amended conditions um, by Mr. Anderson. Thank you. Please vote on that recommendation and please post. And thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you, Sean, too. That motion carries. We'll move on to agenda item 51, 230656 SUP1, also public hearing applicant United Con Machine Company, owner Elkhorn Wallapai LLC, possible action land use and entitlement project request for a proposed gaming, incidental gaming machines only, 
Use 7161 North Wallop High, Suite Number 110, PD Plan Development Zone, VC Village Commercial Cliffs Edge Special Land Use Designation Ward Forward Councilwoman Polanski, Planning Commission and Staff. Wow, we're on a roll. Recommend approval. It's a public hearing which I declare open. Is the applicant present? No. Therefore, Mr. Lloyd. Thank you, Mayor Seth Floyd. For the record, staff recommends approval. The proposed gaming and sit gaming machines only use would be located within a shopping center with compatible retail, restaurant, office, and personal service uses. Therefore, the proposed use can be conducted in a manner that is harmonious and compatible with existing and future land uses. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone from the public, last chance? I'll close public hearing. Any comments from council, please? Okay, Councilman Polanski. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, this has been an interesting journey on this one. The applicant initially had an appointment in my office and, and did not show up. So uh, I don't know exactly what to say. I will point out, and I don't want to be repetitive, but uh, in our backup, we have 14 postcards against it from the neighbors in the area, and I will say that's oh. over double the number of postcards that we have gotten against pickleball at Wayne Bunker. So at least by my estimation and being here 15 months, there's a pretty overwhelming amount. Uh, there's a no more gaming. There's already a crappy Dotties to gamble at. This keep this BS out of our neighborhoods. Uh, bad for neighborhoods, not appropriate next to homes and churches, terrible for children and traffic. And I could read on, but I'll save all of our time. Uh, in light of not hearing from the applicant in the past, in light of the applicant not showing up today, I have grave reservations about moving forward. I guess I'm moving to obey this for 30 days and hopefully someone reaches out. But um, in light of that, I don't feel comfortable moving forward. So at this point... Um, obey or deny? What would that be? April 17th? Yeah, I'd be willing to give them 30 days to uh, come and reach out. So if you're out there. Oh, well, right. Please. Because you're not here. And if this request has been put forward, there was an opportunity here with no showing. That yeah, you that's would not how be I felt moving a month forward, ago. <laughs> especially with your residential input. Yep. So um, if that's the motion, again, April 17, this being obeyed, uh, that's the motion. Would yes, you please vote? and post. And that motion carries. That's very nice. Thank you. Agenda item 52, reports and presentation, a report by Celise Rayford, Region 2 Superintendent on the current educational operations in schools within the Clark County School District in the city of Las Vegas. And this, of course, applies to all wards. Good morning, Hi. or afternoon. Madam Mayor, uh, Dr. Tammy Malich, Director of Youth Development and Social Initiatives for the record. I missed you all so much, I decided to come right back <laughs> up here. Um, so uh, per NRS 388G.630 and CCSD Regulation 2130, as a result of AB 469 passed in the 2017 uh, 79th legislative session, the Clark County School District is required to provide quarterly updates to the governing board of each city and county. This quarterly report uh, document has been um, uploaded and provided to the public and addresses proficiency and proficiency gaps in English language arts, ling English language arts, grade three reading, mathematics, and science, the Nevada School Performance Framework, advanced coursework, diversity and achievement in high schools, CTE enrollment and diversity, high skill, high demand programs of study, international baccalaureate, magnet school enrollment, chronic absenteeism, and behavior for students who attend City of Las Vegas schools. This report will be provided by Region 2 Superintendent Celise Rayford. And will there be any comment uh, made regarding what the decisions are moving forward in the district as far as the superintendent? Good morning. Good Thank morning. Thank you for coming. Madam Mayor, City Council members, Celise Rayford, Region 2 Superintendent, Clark County School District. Um, our school board of trustees, they have decided, I think, on a national search. 
Um, they're going to seek input from the community as well to hear what constituents are looking for in our next instructional leader for the district. Thank you. Uh, district regulation requires that I share with you the status of the district's compliance with NRS 388G.500-820, the reorganization law, and align state and district regulations. Compliance with state law and regulation is monitored by the state superintendent of public instruction who may provide a notice of noncompliance if a deficiency is found. There are no outstanding notices of noncompliance. The district also produces an annual reorganization compliance report documenting compliance with requirements of state law and regulation and the district's own aligned regulation. For the report reflecting the requirements of fiscal year 2023, the compliance analysis included in the report found that out of 30 points of compliance, the district found two instances of noncompliance. Both were related to the submission of reports in calendar year 2022. The quarter four was uh, submitted for your review, which as Dr. Malich uh, indicated, included proficiency and proficiency gaps in English language arts, math and science, Nevada school performance framework, advanced coursework, diversity and achievement, chronic absenteeism and student behavior data. Highlights and celebrations include just a few. Uh, Rex Bell Elementary School, Franklin Covey, was thrilled to announce that Rex Bell Elementary School was awarded a sponsorship grant for the implementation of Leader in Me and Franklin Covey Education Products and Services. Howard Hollingsworth STEAM Academy, they held their second annual Community Day event during the Super Bowl week. There were more than a dozen active and former players that took students through a day of fun-filled drills and a pizza party. And then lastly, in honor of the Youth Art Month, CCSD students had the opportunity to have their talents showcased at Harry Reid International Airport. During the Super Bowl, 3D pop art artist Charles Fanzino held an interactive workshop for students from John C. Fremont Professional Development Middle School and Academy of Medical Sciences, Global Community High School, and Valley High School. The original art piece was located in Terminal 1, and this concludes the report. Thank you very much. Any questions, comments? I think we've um, have asked for but received any of the data that are uh, ward specific, so I think we're comfortable. We appreciate you coming down. Thank you. Yes, a comment from Councilwoman. Yes. Thank you, Madam yes. Mayor. I just wanted to make you aware that we recently received a report back of um, from our residents of the city of Las Vegas. Uh, we do a survey and um, I think we should probably share that one of the top concerns in the survey was education. Um, and so I think if we're hearing that from our residents, it's incumbent upon us to hopefully share at least how the rankings came in and how folks were not 100% satisfied with our educational offerings. And so just wanted to make you aware that we heard it loud and clear and we saw it come through um, in, that, in that vein. And it was, I can't remember how many folks we surveyed. Do you remember, Mike? David, do you remember how many folks were surveyed? Nine hundred and something. For the record, uh, Councilman, I'm sorry, uh, Communications Director David Riggleman, 912 were surveyed. So these are obviously residents from each ward. Um, I think, you know, just being good partners and sharing data and information, this is something that you all should probably take a closer look at and see what could be done to hopefully um, I don't know, address some of the concerns, okay. community Thank concerns. Thank you. Thank you. I will definitely take that back. Thank you. Appreciate Be it. Be well. Keep working. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. We will now ask our city clerk uh, to set the public hearing dates and appeals from the city planning commission meetings, dangerous building or nuisance litter abatements, please. Will do. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we will now move into our second and final citizen participation. Public comment during this portion of the agenda must be matters within the jurisdiction of the City Council. No subject may be acted upon by the Council 
unless the subject is on the agenda schedule for action. If you wish to be heard, please come to the podium, give your name for the record. The amount of discussion on any single subject as well as the amount of time any single speaker is allowed may be limited. It's your opportunity to address the council, but a council is not able to respond or engage in dialogue. So, good morning still. We have nine minutes. Nine so minutes? Nine minutes of morning left, and it's springtime oh. <laughs> in Las Vegas. I, I don't know what to do with that much time. <laughs> I don't think I can speak that slowly. Um, Madam Mayor, Daniel Braisted, B-R-A-I-S-T-E-D. Um, there's been several national cases um, where the individual injured was injured by an, a resident that was not legally in this country. Hmm. The problem is it wasn't mentioned in the news item. Either the, I doubt if that was an oversight. I'm saying it's part of the scheme to play it down. And I'm asking this body here to put some rules on all these murders, assaults, and DUIs in our area and give us a background on them. Did they just move here? Uh, are they illegal? Uh, you, know, you do mention prior convictions, but something has to be done to push back on this. On a positive note, <coughs> One of my favorite uh, conventions is the National Hardware Show, and that's next week, midweek. I have a pass that I can enter in, NHSPASS326. Now this is a picture, let's see, I, got, oh, I still got 10 minutes, good. Um, realize that a hardware show across the country in small communities uh, is more like a general store. So they offer everything in it. They might have a plastic pool, they might have a thousand dollar jackhammer, they might have screws and nuts and bolts and, and all that stuff. And I encourage those of you that want to incur incorporate more of this great asset that we had for trade shows into our community to go visit. Call up one of your colleagues and say, hey, we want to talk about this. Well, let's go to the convention and just walk the halls and see it. Um, take Uber. Take Uber. You can ride there, do your homework, go in, watch, walk half of it, catch lunch, and, and get out. And you don't have to be there for the full three days. One of the areas you do want to look into, and, it, and those of you that have manufacturing in your districts, they should go down there and look at the new inventions. New inventions need a place to be manufactured. So they have an area there, and they have a, a panels from Lowe's, Home Depot, and Amazon, and other people that are evaluating ideas. So that's a great education for your community to learn about building. So I have a slip of paper. I don't know if it's been passed out. But again, the pass to walk the floor for free is NHS. Pass, P-A-S-S, -S, and the number is 326. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, extra time. Okay, anyone else? I'll close our second public comment. We'll move on to agenda item 55. This is reference emerging issues, and uh, any discussion has to be limited to the proposed idea, rather intent and not any discussion, just counsel. Does any member of our council have anything to bring forward? No, 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 you're free again? Wow, you're doing it well. And so now we'll move on to council member recognition, as I recall. And this is agenda item 56, comments made by individual city council members during this portion of the agenda will not be acted upon by the council unless this subject is on the agenda and scheduled for action. So, last time I think we're now back to Councilwoman Bernie. Thank you, Mayor. Congratulations again to all the animal rescue groups that were recognized today and even those who weren't recognized today who are taking care of the animals in our community. Team Bruni was pleased to attend Boys Town First Legislative Breakfast where Boys Town team members shared the impact of the nonprofit organization's work in our community and uh, especially on our kids and families. March is International Women's History Month. Here in the city, 40% of our workforce is women, or are women. 
Congratulations again to AutoNation for opening in the Centennial Hills area. We know that many college and high school seniors are looking for jobs during the summertime. Stop by our job fair uh, on March, our first one on March 23rd from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. And if our young people want to put their water skills to use, stop by our aquatics job fair on April 6th or April 27th from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. Join us March 30th for our Spring Fling, which will have something for everyone. We'll have a classic car show, a bouncy house for kids, our pet parade and adoption event, and a resource fair for families, especially our Valley's foster families. Join us at Floyd Lamb Park for fun between 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. Join Councilman Alan Polensky and I on April 5th for our first movie in the park of the 2024 season. There will be lots of free and fun festivities for our young kiddos. We'll be hosting our small business breakfast on April 10th from 8.30 to 10 a.m. at the Centennial Hills Y. We'll be joined by Guy Hobbs who will provide some insights into our local and national economic trends. On the April 11th, join us for our monthly Bocaditos with Bruni from 9 to 11 at our Centennial Hills Y satellite office. And then finally in April, please join us for the city's Bluegrass Festival April 13th from 11 a.m. to 7 p.m. Uh, we'll have food trucks, but feel free to bring a blanket and some snacks because you'll want to stay the whole day and enjoy the amazing music. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councilwoman Bruni. Councilwoman Polensky. Thank you, Madam Mayor. The city of Las Vegas family suffered a terrible loss over the weekend with the passing of Economic and Urban Development Director Ryan Smith. We are so thankful that we had a chance to know him and our heartfelt prayers are with his family and children during this difficult time. To close out Nevada Reading Week, I provided donuts and juice and read to the kids at Cimarron Rose Memorial, excuse me, community, Cimarron Rose Community Center for their annual Juice with Seuss event. A big shout out to Kristen Carducci and her staff who do an incredible job of providing fun and meaningful programming to all the children at Cimarron Rose. My staff and I made it out to the city employee picnic on Saturday, March 9th. Kudos to Christy Garnis and our whole team for their tireless work and professionalism in making every City of Las Vegas event fun and successful. I'm grateful to my staff and the thousands of city and um, city staff and departments who helped to make our city the best place to live and raise their families. On Saturday, alongside with our city marshals, Parks and Rec Department, and Get Out Noors Nevada, I helped to plant trees at Wayne Bunker Park. Even with the weather not being optimum, more than 30 volunteers came out to help make their community beautiful. Great job to everyone. I appreciate your dedication and hard work. Also on Saturday, I hosted another successful shredding event in Sun City, no fires. The event went smoothly, we received awesome and positive feedback serving over 300 cars in just two hours. A big thanks once again to the special events team for all their hard work and always doing it with a smile. Uh, on Friday, March 22nd and Saturday, March 23rd, Lone Mountain Little League and Mountain Ridge Little League will be having their opening day ceremonies. Come out to Mountain Ridge and Children's Memorial Parks for a fun time with the whole family. There'll be bounce house, food trucks, parade of teams, and raffles. I'll be at both. Uh, so Councilman Creer will be throwing out the first pitch at Lone Mountain Little League where my son plays, and I'll be throwing out the first pitch at Mountain Ridge. So hopefully I do a better job than him. Uh, no injuries. <laughs> Thank you, Councilman Diaz. Uh, next up, I will be hosting another shredding event at Desert Shores on Saturday, April 13th from 10 a.m. to 12 a.m. 12 p.m. <laughs> at the Desert Shores Community Center parking lot located at 2500 Regatta Drive. Please remember to remove all metal clips, staples, and batteries for, before dropping off your boxes. 
No drug drop off, just shredding? Just shredding, Mayor. Okay. No drug drop off. Uh, okay. We will do that at the next one. Good. Next, this slide features the faces of five children from Las mm. Vegas who have been uh, missing in 2024. If you have any information, please call Las Vegas Metropolitan, the Police Department, Missing Person Detail at 702-828-3111. And if you are a runaway, please visit Nation, National Runaway Safety Hotline uh, at 1-800-786-2929. There is always a free bus ride home at the end of that. And lastly, stay connected with my staff and I on social media platforms or contact us directly. Please call 702-229-2524. We're always here to provide any assistance that we can. Thank you. Thank you. Councilwoman Seaman. Thank you, Madam Mayor. So I want to thank the city's public works team for hosting a neighborhood meeting to discuss the Summerlin Parkway Trail Project in Ward 2. This new trail will connect the 215 Beltway Trail and the Bonanza Trail. We held two extremely successful human trafficking awareness events this month. So I want to thank both Fervent and Hope Churches for partnering with me on these events and Councilwoman Carrie Cox of Henderson for co-hosting the Henderson event with me. I will be holding more of these informative events in the future. I want to thank the Buffalo Coalition Neighborhood Association. First, I want to thank uh, Councilman Knudsen for uh, allowing me to represent those wonderful people. They're absolutely wonderful. Um, so at this safety fair, I had the opportunity to recognize them with a proclamation from the Mayor and City Council for their outstanding efforts in keeping their neighborhoods safe. One of my favorite times of the year is Reading Week. I enjoyed reading to the children of MJ Christensen and Bonner Elementary Schools. I presented a certificate of recognition uh, from the mayor and the Las Vegas City Council to Flawless Med Spa during their International Women's Day Spring Soiree. I'm grateful for the Flawless Med, Steam, Med Spa team to highlight the important role of self-care for women. Spy Ninja HQ Adventure Park finally opened its doors after a long anticipated wait and I presented a certificate of recognition for their grand opening and ribbon cutting. Congratulations to owners Chad Wild Clay and V Quant. This adventure park will captivate adventure seekers of all ages. I then want to thank uh, Councilwoman Alan Polanski for helping me to present a proclamation to the Las Vegas Buddhist Sangha Center, a beacon of compassion and enlightenment profoundly impacting our community. I hosted a luncheon at City Hall to recognize our own Summerlin Captain Lepore's son, Joey Lepore, for his um, Volunteer of the Month with the Nevada SPCA. I presented Joey with a certificate um, and from the mayor and city council recognizes his remarkable achievements. I appreciate his dedication to the animal community, a passion I share with him. And I want to thank all the animal lovers and rescues who came out for the Three Dog Bakery and our Ward 2 Pet Adoption Fair Easter Bag Hunt. These amazing men and women who run all these incredible animal rescues are true heroes for giving their time and money to see our animals find safe and loving homes. If you have, these are our upcoming events. I don't know why I lost. Um, Breakfast Buzz and War 2 Biz, eight, Saturday, April 6th from 9 to 10 at Veterans Memorial. And directly after we finish that, we're going into a document shredding and medication disposal right in front of the Pavilion Center Pool in the parking lot. And for those of you who love art, our Art in the Park this year will be April 20th at Bruce Trent Park from 10 to 4. And if you're an artist, you still have time to get a booth. Next slide. And our adopt -a pets for this uh, council meeting is Valerie, a terrier pit bull mix, female, 45 pounds, about eight years, and Sugar, a domestic long hair female, nine pounds, about 10 years old. Next slide. 
So for those of you who want to get your business out in our Ward 2 business uh, feature on all of our social media channels, you can contact us at 702-229-2420 or email us at ward2 at lasvegasnevada.gov. If you have any issues in Ward 2, please contact my office at 702-229-2420 same 702 or you can email us at ward2 at lasvegasnevada.gov. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Nice picture. Councilwoman Diaz, you've been a busy lady. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, let's see here. I want to thank everyone who came out to the East Las Vegas Community Center um, on March 9th to celebrate International Women's Day Expo. Uh, it was a, an expo and a resource fair um, for all the community, not just the ladies, but um, as a councilwoman for Ward 3, I was honored to co-present this incredible event alongside partners like La Campesina 96.7 and uh, PLV. Big thanks to 60 plus small businesses and organizations for their valuable participation and services and their dedication and collaboration were instrumental in making this a tremendous success. I just want to put on everyone's radar that uh, this Friday through Sunday, 322 to 324 from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m., um, out of uh, Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department headquarters, uh, they're going to be um, putting anti-theft devices or updating them in Hyundai's. Hyundai's have been a, a type of vehicle that has uh, suffered um, from car theft and we're trying to combat it. So you'd need no appointment, no registration, no cost to you if you're an owner of a Hyundai. There's certain um, models and years that they're looking at. So go ahead and take a picture of this and get in there uh, through the QR code so you can see if your model will be um, one that's affected and will be hopefully after the so software upgrade um, more um, secure for people not to steal your vehicle from you. It only takes uh, less than 30 minutes for um, this upgrade to, to take hold. So again, take no, eight to six, any Hyundai owners that you know, let them know Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and they can just show up and get this uh, software upgrade to keep their cars protected. On Saturday, March 23rd, um, we're having the Art U OK um, event at our historic Fifth Street School. And um, we're going to have just different presentations from Mike Xavier, Lit Reezy, Elijah Stone. And this is just basically to address mental wellness in our community and especially in our youth. So if you are available, come on down from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. and um, join, uh, join us in all of the fun activities to make sure that we are okay. I want to uh, let everyone know that this Saturday out of Stupac Community Center we'll have an Easter egg hunt um, from noon to 2 and the hunts will be organized by age group and uh, we'll be giving things away while supplies last. Uh, so we need kids ages walking to 11 years of age and uh, again our Stupac Community Center and our fabulous folks that work that community center uh, are located at 251 West Boston Avenue and I hope we see you all there this Saturday. Also want, Saturday's gonna be a busy day. Also want to invite everyone to a film screening, a fil film screening to celebrate the legacy of the labor leader, Cesar Chavez. And um, this is going to be out of the renamed downtown cinema. So it used to be Art House, before that it was Eclipse. So if you kind of know where that is, adjacent our Third Street Promenade on 814 South Third Street, come on down, enjoy this film screening, 2 p.m. Uh, the Cesar Chavez Foundation is bringing a speaker to kind of prime and highlight and speak about Cesar Chavez and uh, his historical accomplishments and at 3 p.m. is the actual film screening. This is all done with Cesar Chavez Foundation, Make the Road, 96.7 La Campesina, uh, Chicanos por la Causa, and Chispa. So um, I hope that if you, have, if you need any information, call us 702-229-5428. I want to put a plug out that uh, green drop ribbon cutting ceremonies are happening throughout um, Clark County and Big Brothers Big Sisters main headquarters relocated to the city of Las Vegas in the downtown area. But everything that they do, the work that they do does rely heavily on donations that we all make. So when we have lightly or gently used clothing, shoes, books, housewares, um, that helps our nonprofit organization continue to 
partner youth who need a mentor. Um, and so just wanted to shed light that they're going to have these ribbon cuttings Wednesday, April 3rd through uh, Thursday, April 4th, and kind of show the community how they can drop off their gently used items at these convenient locations. And just in time for spring cleaning, because all of us want to get rid of stuff we don't need anymore. Um, in the past, we've had to limit sometimes how many pools we offer and the hours. So again, just putting out the information about our um, lifeguard recruitment. Please help us find those lifeguards that are in our community that are, w want to make sure that every pool user is safe and that we can um, open all of our pools. So the next one's coming up Saturday, April 6, 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. and Saturday, April 27th, 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. One's at the pavilion pool on the 6th, the other one's at the muni pool on the 27th. Please, please, please share this with the swim, swim teams in our high schools so that we can um, have those lifeguard positions uh, filled. Uh, also want to um, save the date for our upcoming um, shredding event with in cooperation with our Las Vegas City Employees Association, Friday, April 19th from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. It's gonna be held in their parking lot of the LVCEA of the LVCA office, 857 Northeastern Avenue. Um, so again, just please make sure there's no batteries, there's no clips, um, there's nothing that's gonna start a fire as we shred your documents. Um, so just uh, go to our social media channels and you'll find more information about what we'll take. This will, um, and also I think there is, ex we will be accepting expired meds to your earlier question, uh, Mayor, that we will be taking expired medications. Yes, we really need to keep control of those because there's just so many problems as we know with young people and especially little children thinking it's candy and have a special note on yours no syringes no syringes or liquids, or liquids just yeah. pills we want to make sure we destroy those and dispose That's of them appropriately last reminder tax season is almost coming to a close hard to even fathom but I just want to put a plug again for the good work they're doing out of the Mexican consul offices for community and residents who need help with tax preparation so go ahead and jump on that QR or Calendly to schedule your appointment and that's it for me stay in touch with us 702-229-2359 drop us an email ward3 at lasvegasnevada.gov or you can also message us so thank you so much thank you very much councilman Creer. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, before I get started, I know there's a class at UNLV that has been instructed to watch our city council meeting. I want to welcome you all uh, today, especially my daughter Kennedy's good friend, uh, Sonoma Cayley. So uh, hello, everybody at UNLV. Hope you guys learned something today. Uh, our first event is our Tennis and Fun event, our annual event, which is our Ward 5 uh, and Aspiring Children's Foundation. It's going to take place at Lorenzi, 3333 West Washington Avenue. On Friday, March 22nd from 5 to 7 p.m., it is usually a great time. We get a great turnout as well. So come out and learn how to play the great game of tennis. Uh, Rolling into Doolittle, which is an old school car show and Easter egg hunt uh, at the Doolittle Community Center. And uh, Kianga Isoki uh, Palacio Park, which is at 1950 J Street. It's Saturday, March 23rd from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. Should be a really good time. Please come on out. Uh, for more information, 702-229-6374. And then we're going to be celebrating our one-year anniversary, it's kind of hard to believe, of the Ernest and Betty Becker Family Technology Center and Recreation Park. Mm -hmm. uh, that is at 2221 Maverick Street on Saturday, March the 30th from 1 to 4 p.m. We're going to have a lot of activities to celebrate such a beautiful recreational center and uh, technical center. It's been widely successful and um, we're really happy with the work that is going on there. <clears throat> We're going to bring back our annual Symphony Park Arts Festival on Saturday, March 25th from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. Every year, this just grows and grows and grows, and it's just really great to see with all of the apartments that are coming in, um, with uh, potentially the hotel, potentially art museum, uh, and Smith Center, and everything is happening. It's really cool, and it's grown. So if you have any uh, questions, please call 702-229-ARTS, A-R-T-S, R-2787. Then we're going to have another Ward 5 Community Forum, which is going to take place at Gritch Cafe at 1911 Stella Lake Street on Wednesday, April the 10th from 9 to 10.30 a.m. Uh, if you want to subscribe to our new letter, newsletter, which I hope you do, please contact Tanya, my office, at T. Jackson at Las Vegas, Nevada, uh, 702-229-5443. 
And you can always follow us on social media at Twitter, Cedric Career, Instagram, Councilman Career, and Facebook, Councilman Cedric Career. Thank you. That evening shot of the city is just beautiful. Yeah. Terrific. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem, Councilman Knudsen. Thank you, Mayor. On April 4th at 5 o'clock, we're doing a, a bruise with Ward 1. This is at Charlie's Down Under on Buffalo and Lake Mead at 5 o'clock. Please let us know if you can make it. We'll have a lot of fun. And as stated earlier in the meeting, this is Won't You Be My Neighbor Day. It encourages people to perform random acts of kindness and gratitude to their neighbors and anyone uh, they cross paths with. And I think that's a great message. And feel free to reach out to me any way you like. Thanks, Thank Mayor. you. And so every, oh, mm -hmm. beautiful, too okay. beautiful, happy, loved children. Yeah. They just burst with that, it's wonderful. And so families, do your jobs, make sure you take care of your children, be a sounding board for them, listen to them, but stay in their <coughs> lives. People need support. Um, and uh, to our law enforcement, fire and rescue, our technology people, our public, um, information, everything, and our full set of staff, uh, our clerk's office, and um, Mr. Jansen and your team. Uh, we go through tough times, and so just know that uh, it's always going to smile and sun does come out. So I want to thank you especially and know the sensitivities. This is, um, we're blessed to be here. So thank you all, and until we see you on April 3rd, Wednesday, April 3rd, um, be safe, be careful. Uh, remember um, your neighborhood, I love that. And be kind to our animals too. That's a very important message. So thank you for joining us today, and I didn't know anybody out at UNLV was uh, gonna tune in to us. But knowing that uh, Councilman Career got an inside look, uh, education's the key to opportunity in career and life. And uh, you need to work at it, and you need to make sure that what you end up doing is something you're contributing to others, but that you like what you're doing every day. So thank you, UNLV, and Dr. Whitfield, and your entire family out there. And thank you, and we are adjourned.